this is This Week in Science. I'm Dr. Kiki, <laughs> and I don't know, Blair's talking to her dog off screen. She has a door-opening dog. Yes, it's true. Very smart animal over there. Great <laughs> conversationalist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, Justin has been hurting little children gold mining in the Hurting, hills. not hurting. Hurting. Like hurting. <laughs> hurting. Hurting wrangling. small children, wrangling them all day long. And so he's a little tired, so take it easy on him, all right? And myself, I'm undergoing a lot of stress because next week I'm supposed to go to the San Diego Science Festival. So if any of you are in San Diego, I'll be there next week. Amazing. Science festivaling it up. Um, yeah, it'll be fun. Um, I think I'm going to miss twists next week, though, because okay. the presentation I'm doing is on Thursday night. They oh. love thurs people love Thursdays. I don't think it'll be done in time to do the show. So, anywho, yeah, San Diego Science Festival. I'm also trying to move and right. uh, look for a job, take care of a toddler. <coughs> what else am I doing? Oh, yeah, I'm also doing other work for, for people. Yeah, there's a lot going on. Craziness. Craziness in Twistland. And we were discussing just a moment ago, it seems like everyone in Twistland is looking for a job currently. So if you know of anyone who's hiring fabulous science conversationalists, please let us know. Yeah, because we could have them sit in and do the show while we're out looking for work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Yeah. Uh, maybe next week we can have Pamela, or if there are any of the minions who want to uh, take take up a spot in the uh, in the lineup for next week, maybe we can Come add another person. On in. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a blast. Yeah, that'd be fun. You have to teach me how to work a Google Plus then before next week. Okay, <laughs> I can do that. I can do that. Okay, we can, we can have a meeting. Okay. So it's about nine minutes to 8 o'clock p.m. here on the Pacific Coast, which I mean, which I know means it's getting, what, towards 11 o'clock there on the East Coast? So people are looking at their watches going, come on, come on, come on. Get on, got, on I, with the show. I got a midnight Thank out here. I got a hard out at midnight, everyone. Do the show now. Mm -hmm. So we'll be done with the pre-show banter. As soon as I know that uh, we're all good to go for stories, disclaimer. Ready to rock. All right. I will try and pretend that I uh, have a music set up. Things are still not... I'm moving. I haven't set anything up here. Anyway, yeah, maybe Ulysses. Ulysses or Ed. One of you guys should come in next week. Justin, ready to do the show? Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The world has been waiting with great anticipation. And at last, the smoke has cleared. And we have our answer. The Higgs boson has not only been discovered, but confirmed! And while there have been other announcements made in the past week, few, if any, will have as major an impact on the future of scientific research than this. In physics, anyway. And while some of you silly humans doubted the scientific prognosticator's ability to foresee the unseeable boson, you are all forgiven for your skepticality and can now enjoy a good dose of pure sciencey goodness without feeling like the greatest experiment of the century is doomed to fail. Here on This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. Good Pi Day, Kirsten and Blair. Good science to you too, Justin. We're, we're working high tech here. That's what it's all about here at Twist. Welcome, everyone. This is This Week in Science, and we are here to talk about science. Once again, it's been a bumper crop of science stories this week, and let's just get the ball rolling, shall we? Happy Pi Day! Pi Day! Or is it really Pi Day? I mean, you could really 
be you, you you could argue that maybe it's not I mean today is 314 which could be 3.14 but then uh, you could have 3.141592 which was March 14th 1592 mm -hmm. um, we could uh, also sure. right we could also use um, what can we use oh we could also use uh, minutes and seconds and hours so how do we define exactly at what point of time during the 24-hour period on this planet is exactly pi moment. Sometime so, around yeah. 3 o'clock. You could also do um, March 14th in 2015 would be a good one also. Right. It's coming up. That'll be exciting. <laughs> right. So there will be another pi day. And so when people say, this is the only pi day of our lives. Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. It's the pi day of the year. And I hope everyone is enjoying it. Celebrating the number which allows us to mathematically figure out the, the circumference size, of a pie. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Circles and spheres and stuff. Circles and Before spheres. pie was invented, pizzas were square because and nobody knew square. how to divide them properly. Yes, wheels yeah. also square. Yeah. Not very efficient. Awesome. Very inefficient world we lived in. Mm -hmm. Yes. So anyway, thank you. Pi for bringing us pie. Although I haven't had any pie today. I don't know. I'm drinking crushed grapes. That's close enough. Mm -hmm. Anywho, <laughs> that's like pie filling, just pie fermented filling. a little bit. That's right, fermented pie filling. That's what I'm working on right now. All right, I have stories: death by coronavirus, life on Mars, and monkey brains. Monkey brain? brains. I, like I, I haven't looked at my stories yet, but I believe I have a lot of them. <laughs> That's a good thing to believe. Uh, I hope it comes to pass. <laughs> I've got, oh, oh, no. oh, yeah, there's the Higgs boson story. It's been, uh, there's that. There's uh, uh, olive oil, polar bears, nuisance data, punishment versus reward. I'm not going to get to all of these, but there's a ton of fantastic stories out there right now. Uh huh. Nice. Word. Blair, what did you bring? I have uh, the banning of animal testing on cosmetics in the European Union. Very interesting. And also, uh, how smart are cockatoos really? <laughs> Smarter than a human child? Perhaps. Hmm. I'd mm. love to know. I haven't ever worked with cockatoos, but I have worked with cockatiels. Mm -hmm. And cockatiels are pretty smart. Yes. Yeah. That's very true. I had a cute little cockatiel, mm -hmm. and the cockatiel learned the uh, learned a, a spatial memory task that uh, I was teaching my zebra finches, where we covered oh. up holes of holes in a tray with little flaps of paper, mm -hmm. and one of the holes contained food. It's like kind of like a game of concentration. You mm. flip over the little pieces of card until you find the food, and then. A certain amount of time later, you're presented with this same exact tray again, and then can you find it? My mm. cockatiel could do that, no problem. Bam, bam, bam. With basically no errors, and I could give it back to him like hours later. Well, as I understand it, um, the parrot family, which I think loosely includes uh, cockatoos and cockatiels, um, is also related to the corvids, who are pretty much the smartest birds. So. <laughs> <laughs> they can use tools and communicate with each other in ways that are crazy. So I'm not that surprised that cockatoos are very smart. But we'll discuss just how smart later. Let's discuss. But first, let's jump into the news of... What did I want to put first? Oh, yeah. Hey, maybe there used to be life on Mars. What? what? Right. So uh, there's a bunch of news out. See if I can actually get to the story that I was looking at. But there's uh, been an analysis by the Chem Min instrument and uh, another one that I'm completely blanking on the name of because I'm not the, looking the at the The one I was looking at uh, was doing deep penetration, uh, looks at the undersoils. Right. So it's uh, been uh, in this ancient riverbed area and they've been uh, digging into the into the the sediment you know the topsoil into the sediment and doing geochemical analyses trying to figure out what chemicals are there what uh, is potentially indicative of 
past conditions on Mars, what's indicative of the current conditions on Mars, and trying to recreate from the evidence some kind of story about uh, about Mars's history. And so, at one point in time, there was water flow, uh, flowing on the surface of Mars, and the at this particular location, it appears as if the geochemical analysis has found all of the uh, the chemicals, the all of the building blocks that are necessary uh, for supporting life. Hmm. Yeah. So you remember, like, uh, like, was it last year, the end of the year, where there was a scientist who said, "Oh, this big news," or was it this year already? Big news on Mars. It's going to blow the socks off of blah 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 blah. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and then they then they backtracked, and NASA was like, "Oh well, but, you know, it's not that exciting," you know. I think this is that this was the news. I think that this is what they were looking at. Um, you know, it's not necessarily rewriting history books, but uh, or science textbooks, but it is giving us a new view of this red planet that we've always viewed as dusty, rocky, uninhabitable. That maybe at one point in time it was inhabitable, and maybe it was inhabited. And they used too many fossil fuels at once, and mm -hmm. carbon's built up in the atmosphere. And I don't know. I wasn't going to go there, but you know. <laughs> and then a small robot stowed away on a spaceship. No? Is that something else? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so anyway, yeah, data in, potentially... There could have been, not that there was. It's not evidence that there was life. It's that there could have been because all of the stuff that would have supported life was there. Mm -hmm. And so if it was there, we can probably we could probably deduce that there was life, but we just haven't found that yet. Except, though, except again, gosh, it must be really difficult for life to get started. Mm. Because we have all the right ingredients here on Earth right now. And yet, from what we can tell, or what I've understood, life has only started here once. That's what it, uh, yeah, that's what it seems. But it's started here based on this very particular recipe, where you have certain ingredients that support the baking process, where you have mm -hmm. certain ingredients that... Um, actually create the organisms, the loaf of bread or whatever you're dealing with, um, you know, and you have environmental conditions that actually lead it to rise or to fall flat, you know? Mm -hmm. Did I just, I just made an analogy of life on earth to baking bread. Well, it both involves nice. heat and <laughs> liquid. A little bit of carbon pressure. dioxide, right? Carbon dioxide. <laughs> Well, I think if you gave somebody flour, sugar, baking soda, and butter, they would come up with nope. cookies eventually. No, it would happen. I would never, they might not be I super tasty. I would never tasty. figure out that those things were food. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I gave it to you and told you, make cookies. Yeah. They, they would taste uh, awful for a while, but eventually you'd figure it out. Nope. Given a thousand yeah. years, no. yes, you could do it. Mm -hmm. no. Yes. <laughs> I think yeah, Play yeah Play-Doh would be much more likely. Much more likely to come up with Play-Doh than actually a food product. Yeah. Um, let's see. Going back to the Mars story, they've detected a, uh, the scientists looking at these uh, the the data that's coming back from the instruments on the Curiosity rover have detected a mixture of oxidized, less oxidized, and unoxidized chemicals that can provide the energy required to sustain microbial life. So Curiosity has much more area to explore, and I hope that we find out much more from Curiosity. Um, and in terms of having curiosity and finding out much more about life and uh, the other things that exist on our planet, there's a very interesting story about um, about a new coronavirus, which I believe we reported on a, a year or a little more ago. Not a big deal. It's not really picking up a lot of steam. Not a lot of people have been infected by this coronavirus. It's a coronavirus in the same family of viruses as the SARS virus. And so 
immediately it uh, it it starts to create some concern. But common colds are also uh, some common some of the colds that we have uh, come from the coronavirus family. So you know it could be bad, it could not be bad. However, uh, this virus came about uh, was discovered about a year ago in Jordan. And it predominantly infects people who live in or have who have traveled to the Middle East, and the oh. world. Well, yeah, Blair, <laughs> be on the lookout. Um, the World Health Organization two days ago confirmed the fifteenth case of this infect of the infection with this novel coronavirus, and uh, the fatality count is at nine. So, very low sample size. But within that sample size, a very high proportion have uh, have resulted in death. That said, it's about a year old, and there have only been 15 cases reported, 15 cases discovered, and they're keeping their eyes out for this thing. Uh, so they're keeping their eyes out. This probably will not lead to anything. It may or may not, uh, but the... The World Health Organization and uh, international uh, health organizations have been cooperating to try and uh, come up with some kind of uh, regulations and standard protocols to be followed in the case of something like the SARS outbreak that we experienced back in the early 2000s. Um, yeah, so anyway, not to get excited about nothing to worry about really uh, but it you know it, it who knows we'll see who sees but uh, but there's a perspective article uh, I, I found this in our this article in Ars Technica there's a perspective article in the journal science uh, written by Isabel Nuttall and Christopher Dye of the World Health Organization and they're asking the question of whether or not the regulations that the World Health Organization has implemented are actually adequate so, we how about, shall how about, see. How about forced, uh, what do you call it, when you isolate them from the rest of society and don't let there be any contact until... Quarantine. Quarantine, that's what it is. We need to quarantine ding, these ding, people ding, ding. now, right away. I don't care if it's deadly or not. It doesn't need to even be deadly. I think mean, nine people, whatever, even if it's harmless. Anybody with any kind of a virus should be quarantined from the rest of... What? What? Yeah. Oh, we, hang on, I'm... Oh, we all have viruses in us. We all have multiple, multiple viruses. All living creatures contain viruses. Ah, okay. So here's the deal, folks. Uh, according to the regulations, <laughs> as I just wrote them, nobody is allowed to have contact with anybody else in each ever again. <laughs> ever again. Any all light, of no, us no just travel in those giant um, bubbles. Yeah, I'm glad we, all we have the live. internet, right? No, in, <laughs> in the bubble. I mean, yeah, it's, it's way too early to, like, I mean, you know, people always say, you know, it's way no more blah dee blah than the common cold is uh, related to, the, the common cold kills more people than just about anything else. Right. And, I mean, it's, yeah. it's partly because people don't take it too seriously when they get sniffles because you've survived it a hundred times. So one more time isn't going to, you know, you know, and even like the bird flu in the, in the SARS wasn't really that, it wasn't really that bad. It got a lot of attention, and it scared a lot of people. And but it wasn't really that bad. <laughs> was it really? Not really that bad. And most of the things that have killed <laughs> off large swaths of the human population were before we knew what was causing it. Right. And people didn't wash their hands because they were yucky back then. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Just please. So Wash your hands. I oh, mean, it's the same, the same common courtesy, decency that you uh, should try to exhibit during the flu season, mm -hmm. the cold and flu season, wherever you live. It, cover your nose and mouth when you sneeze. Don't spray the particles all over other people and their food. Wash your hands. And be sure to wash your hands Crazy. before using the restroom. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's when you really need to. That's when, because you've, for your own, this is you've touched. Your hand has touched things that have touched other people's hands. Every <laughs> We've every gone over this everything. before. <laughs> you don't want all of that to touch you and your areas of uh, hygienical perfection. 
So I wonder. I wonder why we never have picked up that habit. It's really interesting. I, I picked that it up. Do. I do that. I mean, I you think the hand, the hand washing though it, it came about as a public health measure uh, to try and get people because uh, public health health officials knew that people were in the bathroom when they went to the bathroom. They're near a source of running water where they can wash their hands, mm-hmm. and for a long time. Nobody did, really, because they weren't really told to. And so public health officials said, hey, you're going to the bathroom. Why not wash your hands afterwards? Da, 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 da. Oh, it's a good time to do it, yeah. Yeah, it's a good time to do it. It's when you can catch people. Yeah. And so that's what gets uh, into the public consciousness. But when yeah. you really think about it. Wash your hands first, people. Mm-hmm. That, your hands have touched every surface that's touched everybody else's hands, especially well, those that when you think about it, before and after. <laughs> yes, before and after. Before and after. After schmafter. Especially if you touch toilet handles and door handles and that kind of stuff. But anyway, oh, like who? we and, and, digress. We are, di- we are digressing. We are digressing. We're digressing. Justin, dig so, into your science Santa sack and okay. uh, pull I'll out a story. The thing and pull out a- okay, so here's uh, brown bears and polar bears. Which came first? Uh, brown bears. Nah. Really? Trick question. Yeah. Well, what? yeah. This is uh, this is recent research on brown bears on an Alaskan archipelago. They have discovered are the descendants of an ancient polar bear population, rather than being uh, the ancestors of modern polar bears. So scientists have long struggled to understand the exact nature of the evolutionary relationship between the brown bear and their Arctic descendants. It is known that these two species can mate successfully both in captivity and in the wild, but how much of their genetic histories are the result of past interbreeding uh, has remained a puzzle. Previous analysis of DNA sequences have yielded conflicting results on the question. The center of the controversy, a group of brown, bear, brown bears that live on the Admiralty baranoff Chicagoff. Uh, it's the ABC Islands of southeastern Alaska. These bears clearly brown bears in their appearance and behavior, inexplicably carry mitochondrial DNA that match polar bears more closely than other brown bears. This had led uh, some to conclude that the ABC Island bears gave rise in ancient times to the modern-day polar bear. The key to solving the mystery was to analyze DNA from the ABC Island bears' nuclear genomes, and in particular their X chromosomes, explained Beth Shapiro, associate professor at UC Santa Cruz, who led the research. Focusing on the X gave us a surprising result. The team, the team compared the X chromosomes of the ABC Island bears to the X chromosome of the brown bears from the Alaska mainland. They found that around 6.5% of the X chromosomes of the ABC Island bears had originally come from polar bears. In contrast, only about 1% of the rest of the genome of the ABC Islands brown bears had come from polar bears. The team simulated various scenarios to determine the most likely evolutionary history of the ABC Island bears. The results suggested a situation that differs considerably from any previously imagined for these bears. They concluded that the ABC Island bears descended from polar bears and uh, that were gradually converted into brown bears through hybridization with male brown bears dispersing from the Alaskan mainland. During a previous ice age, polar bears ranged much farther to the south than they do today. Ooh, that's interesting. Because you sort of think of polar bears as sort of being this sort of like very small ostracized group that they are today, but yeah, back in old and frozen times, they were had much, much greater range of being living their polar bear life style. Gotta uh, live that polar bear yeah. lifestyle. Yeah. So mm-hmm. as, as the climate warmed, ice began to retreat. It's possible that some of the animals began to spend progressively longer time on land with reduced access to ice. We see the same sort of thing happening today with polar bears in areas such as western Hudson Bay or the Russian coast. Hmm. Hmm. So at least for the ABC bears, the brown bear, their descendant most certainly is the polar bear and not the other way around. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I think it's just one of those cases where because those two species have no problems 
um, mating and creating viable hybrids that you're just going to see more and more now, especially since the polar bear's um, habitat is shrinking. You're going to see more and more meshing until eventually there might just be one species. Yeah. And so it's really a question of, of what's going to be dominant. And I think it's not surprising that you have a polar bear and you have a brown bear and you see the brown bear qualities because if you think about basic dominant recessive traits, usually the darker hair color is dominant and the lighter hair color is recessive. So naturally you're going to see the darkness of the brown bear showing up um, taking over the polar bear white. But you're probably going to see things in those brown bears that you might see in a polar bear like the webbed feet or uh, the hair in between the foot pads or the extra layer of fur. You might see any of those things. I would like to see in this study, because I read this earlier too. That's what I'd really like to see is if is to them to examine for other polar bear traits in these brown bears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It seems interesting to me. Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, yeah, it, it, the, the research that we'd all heard earlier that, that I know that we talked about on the show before just mm -hmm. always suggested that you know you had the brown bears and then they had the genetic uh, mutation that allowed them to uh, allow their hair to become transparent and so they were able to adapt to the icier climate up north and then you've had mm -hmm. them go back and forth over you know changes different ice ages that polar mm -hmm. bears have become more brown bears and then gone back to being polar bears um, and I think we argued about this for a while too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I like it. I like. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah. This is this week in science, everyone. Blair, it's time for Blair's Blair's Animal, Animal Corner with Blair. Works at a zoo. Fond of hippos. Not so much when it comes to pandas and polar bears. Yeah. So let's start right off with some smart animals. Yay! Okay, cockatoos. So I want to talk about this experiment that they did um, in Vienna with cockatoos. But in order to explain it, I first have to talk about the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment. Um, some of you might have heard about this. In the 70s, they did a test of self-control in human infants where they handed a child a marshmallow and they said you can eat this marshmallow now or if you wait just a little bit and don't eat it i'll wait, give what? you another marshmallow oh, I already ate it. And, and yeah there's there are the kids <laughs> like justin who are like oh i already ate it and then there are the other then there are other kids who are like no no i want to eat it i want to eat it so badly Good job, there's another marshmallow. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, really cool. And you can see how with kids especially, they might have some really tough problems with that. Um, and so what they found in this super long-term study, ready, <laughs> that these kids that were able to wait for the second marshmallow overall showed greater success in adult life than the ones that ate them right away. <laughs> and so they, they said, you know, that this makes sense because you're anticipating delayed gain and that has to do with economic responsibility as an adult. So you can see how that could be related, some ingrained things where you can wait for delayed uh, increased gratification. So, they've seen other animals, a few other animals, actually able to do this as well. Um, enable, they were able to inhibit consumption of an immediate food reward in anticipation of a bigger one for up to or slightly over a minute. Well, see, so, now I could do that for slightly over a minute. Well, a lot, toddler <laughs> can't really. So this new study, so they wanted to look at uh, a bird because they had thought that bird species couldn't really inhibit uh, the behavior. They couldn't wait 
for a food reward later. Um, but they found, obviously, that crows could. Big surprise, because yeah. crows are so very smart. Well, and then you have, I mean, it depends on the species, I'm sure, but you have all sorts of uh, storing species, the caching right. species of birds, that they're waiting months and months and months to find, to go back to their cached food sometimes. I mean, and, that's some yeah. serious self-control. And are right. they actually going back to their cache, too? Or, yes. or yes. Is, it is yes. their own cache? Yes. Was yes. it the yeah. squirrels that we were finding? There was something. Was it squirrels or blue jays that... Squirrels. The they're, squirrels they were randomly placing, but then... They're ransacking other people. And then, and then in spring, <laughs> looking squirrels. at places. Okay, if I was a squirrel, where would I hide nuts? Yeah. And then they just got mm -hmm. searching those places. Yeah. So, yeah, the birds, they actually store for themselves. So, yes, they pick these things up, and they don't eat them right away. They put them somewhere else. But these cockatoos had this amazing test where if I had, let's say, an almond in this hand, which is a pretty good treat. They like almonds. But then I had a cashew in this hand, which they love cashews. I would show them both. So they see I have both an almond and a cashew. But then I took away the cashew and offered them the almond. They were able, 14 different birds in this study were able to pick up the, the almond, hold it in their mouth for up to 80 seconds. And then I showed my hand back to them. They put the almond back in my hand. I give them their cashew. So they don't like That's almonds? Impressive. They love almonds, but they, they love, love cashews more. Yeah, it's all about the, uh, the, the drive, the motivation. Like, what is the... Uh, What's the word? What's the word? I'm blanking on the word. Uh, so, so if reward. they ran a, the reward, yeah. yeah. So if they ran an experiment where they showed an almond mm -hmm. and another almond, mm -hmm. would they just eat the first one? Well, if they if they were able to be trained to figure out they would get the second almond if they waited, I'd imagine that would work. But the problem is that with birds, you're just dealing with a different. Um, set of tools, for lack of a better word. They have, you know, their beak, they don't have hands. It's not like an ape where you can have them hold two things and then eat them both. So that actually leads me to the other really interesting part of this study is that something to be kept in mind is with the kids, you hand them a marshmallow, it's in their hand. They put that marshmallow in their mouth. But the birds pick up the food with their mouth, and they mm -hmm. can taste that almond while they're holding it. Mm. And they mm -hmm. don't nibble on it. And so the, the article says this. I love this. They say, imagine placing a cookie directly into a toddler's mouth and telling him or her that he or she will only receive a piece of chocolate if the cookie is not nibbled for over a minute. No yeah, luck. Right. No luck. No oh, wait. Luck. I didn't understand the experiment. Let's start over. Let's start <laughs> over. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So I hold up. I'm going to eat the cookie and I, while I wait for the – oh, I'm not supposed to eat it. Yeah. I got it this time. Let me try now. Let me try now. I think I got it. Yeah. So it's it's absolutely crazy that these birds were able to figure out if I give you back the almond, I get a cashew. <laughs> And they were actually able to wait for it. Wow. Um, I think it's fantastic. You know, it, I'm brought back to that whole concept of bird brain, which mm -hmm. I think is so funny. because It's more, not true. The, it's a lie. The more you look into the, the animal kingdom and you look at birds, uh, especially, you know, corvids and parrots, if you look at them in relation to other animals in the animal kingdom, there's just no contest at all. They're so smart. Hmm. Yeah. Yep. So I what, loved that story. I, the lab that I worked in, uh, the professor, Nicola Clayton, the, who I, whom I worked for, she always said, bird, if, you have, if anyone ever calls you a bird brain, take it as a compliment. Mm -hmm. You should. That's you right. Absolutely should. They're so smart. They're so smart. These little brains. Their brains are smaller than ours. Yeah. I love it. <sighs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And then my second story, somewhat inflammatory, not super interesting though really, is that it's kind of it's an interesting topic to discuss. But the European Union has made a complete ban of the sale of cosmetics developed through animal testing. 100% ban. That means wow. even if you do your testing in another country, you are not allowed to sell in the European Union. Okay. 
which on first response, my first response to that was, great, because, you know, there's a lot of things that animal testing is really important for, such as drugs that could potentially cure cancer or reduce the effects of cancer or any number of things in the medical field. But do we really need to be hurting animals to approve a new type of face foundation? Maybe not, right? Yeah. At this point in time? Hmm, no. Yeah. I don't think so. The problem is that if you think about the cosmetic um, industry establishment, they're going further and further into what could be considered pharmaceuticals. Right. They're putting That's collagen true. in things. They're putting there's some things you can buy that have some form of Botox in it. There's all sorts of things that you can buy that could have long-term health effects that we wouldn't know about. And so one thing that someone said towards the end of this article was that there's no ability to do a cancer study on anything now um, that could be considered cosmetics. So you can't do any sort of test to see if there's adverse effects. I just kind of pictured them testing rabbits for skin rashes and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot that is covered in the cosmetics world under that umbrella that... Mm -hmm might actually be dangerous to us not be able to do any testing anymore. New kerosene wrinkle remover. Try to avoid eyes. <laughs> like, yes. Do they put disclaimers on it? Or, like, do they... Because, no, I mean, the, part of it's, like, okay, the, the, the first thing I heard, is, heard was, like, okay, they've already tested, you know, XYZ chemicals that they use in cosmetics for mm -hmm. 10, 20, 30-plus years probably don't need to test it every time they come out with a new brown uh, brand or foundation or whatever it is. Uh, but then, yeah, then it did creep into like, well, okay, so it's not just about grandfathering in, or do they remove they get, everything that's ever been tested gets removed too and there's no makeup. I think that's like, the case. Yeah, so everything has to be grandfathered in that they've been doing. So really, what's left but new stuff? that hasn't been tested. Mm -hmm. And how does that sit with people? Yeah, yeah. That's It could be pretty dangerous. <laughs> but at least they'll be testing it in Europe. Not here. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I guess all of the Europeans uh -huh. are the test subjects <laughs> yep. for all of these things. I don't know. It's I'm, I don't think it'll reach to America. I, I, I don't really see that passing any sort of... Um, bill or anything where yeah. that's actually going to happen but um, I don't know it's it, it opens a very interesting debate because I think there's mm -hmm. a lot of people in this in the scientific community that are that have no problem with testing on animals for medical needs but definitely are against frivolous animal testing I am for well, sure well, for but both. where is for... the line of okay. frivolous and necessary where the, do you put that line? I would put you that know? line right at, has this been done before in some manner? And I, I think, you know... Well, well, there are a lot of terrible things that have been done before, and we don't do them anymore because huh? we decided no, no, that no, they no, were no, terrible. That's not what I mean. That's not what I <laughs> talk about at all. I'm not talking about that. No, what I mean is, what I mean is uh, there's an incredible amount of redundancy in animal testing, um, mm. Medical, scientific, um, cosmetics, surely. Mm. I mean, you know, there's got to be a point where we are pooling this data, you know, between companies, between scientists, yeah, and no, in the databases, where we may still need to test a particular drug if we're looking at aspects that haven't been looked at before or trying a more controlled or different experiment. But a lot of what's been done, because it's been done so many times and for so many years, uh, probably isn't necessary. You know, I don't know that we would really need to test, you know, a new formula of vitamin E, aloe, face moisturizer thing, right? Like, probably, probably doesn't need to get tested in the eyes and ears of a bunny rabbit. Um, but if anything is new or hasn't been tested before and hasn't been chemically trialed before, ah, you know, just... I would want to know that it's been tested and is safe before I let, you know, myself wear those cosmetics or whatever. It yeah. just, there's, you know, there's too much weird stuff. 
There's too much weird stuff. Because then you just gotta trust now, the companies. The, the, yeah, which you don't you don't want to trust to just trust the companies. I mean, they have their reputations at stake and they don't want to end up in a situation where, you know, they've got uh, liabilities and their reputation is going in the toilet because they haven't done their research correctly. But right. So what um, happens is they you know, have but a same... spin-off brand that comes right. out with all the new cosmetics. Right, and but it's yeah. blind people they disappear into the night. Right. So the these companies, uh, they like you mentioned them sharing data. Companies are not going to share data. Companies are going to keep, they they have historically and will in the future keep their data secret and classified. However, research that does take place in academic institutions, there are lots of big data efforts right now to you yeah. know. Show, to put the information out in the, you know, in the, the the virtual sphere around our planet to help us know, okay, what chemicals have been tested? How do they react to skin cells, fibroblasts? How do they react to the skin of a rabbit? How do they react to, you know, and you can potentially, um, it, it, and there is, with the genetic information, you can potentially predict how a compound is going to affect a cell, even skin cells, immune cells, whatever, based on what chemicals have interactions with particular, you know, uh, genetic factors. So, mm -hmm. so here's a curveball for you, though. Uh, what about all those researchers that find out, okay, yeah, actually, we don't need to run these 10, 20, 30, 40 experiments, what have you. Who then don't get that firsthand experience of running an, an animal test and running the controls and doing it? Um, now, maybe there's something to the redundancy in animal testing that is just training scientists to be able to run these experiments properly. So, um, you know, <laughs> I hope of, by the time somebody has a job in a corporation and a company that is, you know, working on this stuff, they know how to do it. You know, I hope that well, you not have if all the throughout college they said, well, trained. we don't actually need to have you do this because... Uh, yeah, why don't we simulate it on a computer? Oh, yeah, we'll just simulate it. Oh, by the way, now you work for this corporation, and well, of course you've done testing with animals before, so here's this project. But I, the whole time I was, everything had already been, and I never had to, and so I didn't. No, and I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, that would the, be really bad. The, the kind of... Uh, that touches home with me for uh, when I was in grad school, I, I was a teaching assistant for a lab where we did surgeries on chickens. Mm -hmm. And we were teaching pre-med, pre-vet students who are in their bachelor's year, bachelor science years how to uh, do a whole bunch of procedures and how to monitor blood oxygen levels, how to monitor respiration, you know, how to actually troubleshoot the equipment that, that they potentially could be using in that uh, hospital down in Cuba because they, you know, that's where they've gone to do their work. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 I think that the training that the students had there, the hands-on training, was invaluable. Yeah. And so many students have gone on to medical school and come back and sent emails and been like, oh, wow, you know, without the lab, you know, I, I did this lab and then later on I ended up in a lab where we did this stuff and I knew what I was doing, you know, I didn't go into it completely blind. And so hands-on training, there's definitely something to be said for it. Yeah. And there sometimes is no replacement. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a whole side of it that I hadn't even really thought about until tonight is that there's a lot of people who are going to lose their jobs now. Also, I mean. Right, right. It's, it's a whole other side of it. A bunch of scientists are going to be out on the street now. <laughs> I'm not allowed to test on animals. So now I'll get my, my revenge job. by, by performing my do? tests on people. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of mad scientists. Oh, yeah. Dear. Well, maybe the companies will keep them on to do synthesis of old data or something. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. I hope so. Scientists are very creative people, even though you know very often they are not uh, not characterized as such. But I think that a lot of scientists, if they're worth their salt, will actually help a company to figure out new ways to test their compounds mm -hmm. that don't involve animal testing. That. You know, and maybe it's a really, really uh, important challenge to put yeah. out to these companies. Okay, and every, figure every it out. Every scientist on the staff wants to be that one scientist that can simulate all 
the work that the whole team used to do. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I've got like an app for that now. <laughs> I can make yeah. that happen for you. You don't need my, my coworkers. My you, you know what I don't have an app for? The break? The, break. the bridge? Break. Yeah. Take it to the bridge. Take it to the chorus. <sighs> anyway, it is time for our break. This is This Week in Science, and I'm going to turn on some music over here. Uh... All right, this is the break. This is where we uh, ask you here at we at Twists, I am the voice during this break, but really the whole team, we're asking you to dig deep and to uh, support us in a number of different ways. And so uh, I'm going to tell you about them right now. Number one, you can go to audiblepodcast.com slash twists and sign up for audible.com services if you have not done so before. You sign up, you get a free book download, a free audio book. Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 100,000 different titles in their library. And you get a free one if you sign up at audiblepodcast.com slash twist. And you support us at the same time because we get a little kickback every time somebody signs up. So if you go to audiblepodcast.com slash twist right now, sign up, get a free book, and help us in the process. Additionally, we also have merchandise that you can purchase if you're interested in that. We have a Zazzle.com store, and there's a link to it, thanks to Aaron Lore, wonderful tech computer brilliant genius who's been setting up stuff for us on our website. Uh, there is a Zazzle.com store link on our website. So you just go to twist.org and look for the Zazzle.com store link. And you can go get hats and t-shirts and sweatshirts and all sorts of cool things. And if there isn't something there that you really want, let us know if there is something else that we could put there. Because we could put more things in our store. I just haven't gotten to it yet. And finally, if merchandise isn't your thing, you've already done the audio audiobook thing, or you're just not into that, you do podcasts instead. Um, we also accept donations. So we have uh, PayPal donation buttons all over our website, twist.org. And if you go to the website right now, twist.org, and you can listen to the most recent episode. Well, not right now, because you're probably listening to the most recent episode. But anyway, you go to the show notes. There's... you. Click on an episode, There's you can listen to it, look at the show notes, comment on stuff, and click on one of those pink buttons and donate. And we'll take any amount that you are able to give via PayPal. Two dollars, two million dollars, we're not picky, not choosy. Your donations allow us to do what we do. We really could not do this without you. Thank you for your support. Shoes if you follow his regimen, you will become a most excellent specimen. The power to live on and on for all days is right at your fingertips if someone pays. He says that his order will keep you alive for three easy installments of 10.95. Device he uses sucks out the bad juices. Leaves no bad bruises, it simply deduces the proper percentage of X in your brain. This miracle cure leaves no permanent pain. And still, you can't believe it, but we're here, we're back. What's going on? There are people putting their headphones on all over the place. I lean over to turn on some music and play it through my microphone, and people leave me. I'd never leave you. <laughs> never. Crinkle, 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 microphone sound. Crinkle, crinkle, micro, microphone sound. Oh, the editing is uh -huh. Welcome back, everybody. This is This Week in Science. We're in the second half of our show, and we are 
rapidly going through a lot of the great stories that have uh, shown up in the science news world this week. Um, let's see. Another story that was pretty cool. Monkey brains! Monkey brains! Yeah. I got one. You should have one, too. You should have one, too. Where'd my monkey brain star go? Anyway, you all right. You lost your monkey brain. I lost my monkey brains. No, have I you seen my monkey brain? I see it right here. Anyway, researchers working at the University of Wisconsin in Madison have taken skin samples from rhesus monkeys. Not a lot of rhesus monkeys, just three rhesus monkeys. They took skin samples, took the cells, and using um, what they call the Yamanaka cocktail, which is actually a, uh, a mixture of a bunch of different chemicals and growth factors and uh, genetic instigators that, uh, that together allow uh, adult cells to regress to their pluripotent stem cell baby stage, right? Let these cells go back in time. This is a, uh, a process, a, a cocktail, which has been uh, used over and over again. It's, uh, it seems to work very well. It works okay. It's very good. And I believe that the Nobel Prize in Genetics went to uh, Shinji uh, Yamanaka this last year. From, I could be completely wrong, but I, I believe that's, that's what happened this last year. Um, anyway, pluripotent stem cells. They're cells that can go on to become any other type of cell. So you regress the adult cell. They were skin cells, but now they've gone, to, gone back to being these blank slates of a cell that can become anything. Give them new instructions and they can do whatever you want them to do. So these researchers at the University of Madison, Wisconsin told these cells to become brain cells, neurons, the cells that create, uh, that, that grow into neurons. They took these neural cells, these young cells that they grew, and implanted them back into the brains of the monkeys, which they had um, artificially made to have Parkinson's-like symptoms. So these monkeys have uh, a problem with their dopamine system. The, the cells in their brains are not producing enough dopamine, which is leading to Parkinsonian symptoms. And one of the things that researchers looking into Parkinson's research previously have tried to do is implant uh, embryonic stem cells or uh, other types of cells into the brain of Parkinson's individuals to try and get those cells to take up the, the space, take up the, the lack of activity that's going on in the dopamine producing areas of the brain. That hasn't, that part of it, putting embryonic stem cells into the brains of Parkinson's people, mm -mm, hasn't worked very well. The embryonic stem cells, for uh, whatever reason, they want to grow and make new connections, and they're trying to figure out how to do stuff, and they make all sorts of wrong connections. And so people with Parkinson's who have had these embryonic stem cells implanted into their brains usually get really strange symptoms relating to their movement. Um, but in this particular case, they have shown that these early stage, they're not embryonic because they have been regressed from adult skin cells to pluripotent stem cells, then turned into neurons and put into the brains of these monkeys. It's worked just fine. It hasn't replaced the lack of uh, dopamine. It hasn't fixed the problem that they artificially induced in these monkeys, but it's not causing any problems either. So they're not seeing the kinds of, of problems that have been, that have shown up in other uh, studies that used embryonic stem cells. Which is pretty cool. Monkey brains! That's fantastic. A whole new source of, of stem cells, your own skin. Right? It's fantastic. It takes a lot of the political problems away from stem cells right away. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people who are really hoping that uh, the adult stem cells, the, the cells that have 
been brought back to an early pluripotent stage that they will work in the way all the ways that we need them to. Also, there's some yeah, I was gonna say there's some evidence so far that not that they won't actually do all the things that we want them to, that there are some things that only embryonic stem cells can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't solve all of the problems. It doesn't. Although well, it, it, takes it, some does, of it. it does yeah. reinforce uh, one of my favorite sayings. Uh, despite all the limitations mankind has attempted to put upon it, science finds a way. Science nice. finds a way. Very nice. It does. Yeah, so anyway, monkey brain's doing just fine with stem cells. <laughs> Good Justin. job, monkeys. Good job, monkeys. Go, you little Reese's monkeys. Macaca, macaca. Macaca, macaca. Justin, tell me a story. So astronomers at the University of Chicago's Kavli Institute for Cosmological Physics had a problem back in 2008. They uh, had data from uh, their, their South Pole telescope that had a bunch of bright spots on it. And the light sources were interfering with their efforts to more precisely uh, measure the cosmic microwave background, the afterglow, if you will, of the Big Bang. And this really irritated a lot of people because this, this interference, this light interference, uh, it was just, it was getting in the way of the project. But then they kind of started to realize that maybe there was a discovery and not just interference that was causing the, the problem. In fact, the, it was a specter of uh, these bright objects, which is the uh, uh, sort of the light specter that they were admitting. Were, they were inconsistent with what astronomers had expected from the well-known population of radio galaxies. They looked like dust-enshrouded star-forming galaxies. Right? These are galaxies that should have been already found by infrared sky surveys, but they weren't in any of the data. They weren't there. There were no counterparts for what the South Pole Telescope had found in this region. Hmm. So, which meant that they had to be extremely distant to avoid the infrared detection and and but they could see them they were creating so much light they were interfering with their measurements with their with with their observations so these had to be extremely luminous and extremely far away so uh, going from um, <laughs> irritated to intrigued the astronomers performed detailed follow-up images of the the sources and what is the new uh, a, a Takama Large Millimeter Array, ALMA, in Chile's uh, uh, Atacama Desert. These observations show the dust-filled galaxies were bursting with stars. These were super star-birthing, forming areas that uh, must have been taking place much, much earlier in our cosmic history than <laughs> thought possible or had been previously observed. Uh, Joaquin Vieira, the uh, a now postdoctoral scholar at the California Institute of Technology, leads a team that will report on this discovery in the issue, uh, in the upcoming issue, Nature, uh, journal Nature, and the two other papers that will appear in Astrophysical Journal. We have been eagerly waiting for Alma to be ready so we could conduct these ob observations. The sources we discovered with the South Pole Telescope were so far in the southern sky that no telescopes in the northern hemisphere could observe them. So we're very privileged to be among the first astronomers to use ALMA in this way. So uh, the starburst galaxies produce stars at a prodigious rate, creating the equivalent of a thousand new suns a year. That's a lot of star making in the cosmic you know, sense of time. Uh, Vier and his colleagues have found starbursts that were churning out stars when the universe was just a billion years old. Infant, infant universe pumping out a thousand suns a year in this one little area. <laughs> that's pretty, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that's, it's a very active early uh, universe. Kind of yeah. now it sort of makes a little bit more sense, you know. A uh, thousand stars a year in this one section. It's been a couple, several billion years since. Yeah, wow. No wonder there's so many stars out there. 
Hmm. Well, potentially, if they can uh, get this data to co this discovery to coordinate with other discoveries of, you know, big black holes where they weren't expected, or you know, other other structures that we're finding really far away that, oh, we didn't expect it to be there, you know? So maybe there's a story that's waiting to be told about the early universe that just ha it hasn't unfolded yet because all the data is just coming in. And this is, this is sort of an interesting comment too here. Uh, astronomers are taking advantage of a fortuitous feature of these galaxies' spectra. Normally, more distant galaxies appear dimmer. But it turns out that the expanding universe shifts the emitted spectra in such a way that the light we receive at millimeter wavelengths is not diminished for sources that are more distant from us. So consequently, galaxies appear just as bright in these wavelengths no matter what their distance is. So this mm -hmm. is a great, uh, a great little bit of the spectrum to be doing observations in, obviously. Yeah. Mm. That's cool. I like it. Right. Fun stuff. Um, let's see what other stories do I have tonight. So many. Um, update on the Higgs particle. Um, John Timmer at Ars Technica has reported that uh, all the data coming in makes it look like, yeah, it's standard Higgs. It's uh, every, everything continues to move in the, hey, look, it's the 125 giga electron volt uh, Higgs particle. That's kind of it. So um, there were some hints that the Higgs was decaying into two photons, writes John Timmer, more often than expected, which is something that we've reported previously on, on TWIST, but physicist Matt Strassler notes the additional data has pretty much eliminated that prospect. So it's a an individual Higgs like particle. There we go, just what the standard model was looking for. And the data continues to come in, even though the LHC is now closed for a couple of years. Um, additionally, really, really cool story, um, an atmospheric analysis of an exoplanet that is known as HR8799C. It's really big but it's um, not that big. <laughs> so HR8799 is a, has a big star, four possible Jupiter-like gas giants, um, asteroids, cometary bodies. It's a big solar system. It's like take our solar system and go give it some fructose. Anyway, there was a, uh, an earlier study looking at these four exoplanet can They found the exoplanets, looked at them more closely, and they decided to focus on HR8799C. And they, they're comparing the, the planet to a brown dwarf because it's so big, but they decided it doesn't really match that yes, it's a planet, it's not a brown dwarf. And so they've come to say that uh, this is a really weird planet. <laughs> it's a planet star. Like, it's kind of big. Um, so the star's light doesn't overwhelm the glow or the heat that comes from the planets themselves, these four that they've got out there. Um, these exoplanets are more than five times Jupiter's mass. The largest could be 35 times as large as Jupiter, which is pretty big. And they could be brown dwarfs, which are just like baby stars, not quite big enough to have fusion of hydrogen atoms. Um, so there's this kind of spectrum of where planets, we have rocky planets, gas planets, and then these gas planets get bigger and bigger and bigger, and at one point they kind of cross over into star territory. So the question now is like, are they are they stars? Are they planets? Where, what are, where do they line up? Um, they've looked at the HR8799C using the 10 meter Keck telescope, one of the Keck telescopes, and they've found high levels of carbon monoxide and water. 
and they're uh, present at levels well above the abundance measured in the spectrum of a host star. And so they think that the planet formed via core accretion, so that starts with a, a core, a mass that would bring material to it. And so just make it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, as opposed to uh, kind of like this Saturnian disk system where um, you have ice fragments that merge to make something. So it's an interesting, interesting planet. They have a, they found a lack of methane, and in all the Jupiter-like planets in our solar system, we have methane. And so it's interesting that methane does not exist in this big gas planet. Um, additionally, exoplanet has higher temperatures and pressures that are seen than are seen on Jupiter and ne Neptune, and it could enable reactions that limit methane formation or it could also just be mixing the atmosphere very vigorously. Shake a nostr. Yeah. Anyway, this is a, a young solar system. It's, it's about 30 million years old compared with our 4.5 billion years, and uh, we don't know how it will change. So it could change significantly. I mean, we're going millions to billions of years in an age difference. So, you know, what... I mean, if we could fast forward through time, be able to see what's going to happen with this uh, this bully solar system, you know, what are these planets going to do? Is methane going to, are they going to shrink a bit? Are they going to move in their locations in the, the solar system array? How How is it going to end up? Will they end up with methane? Who knows? Anyway, a very interesting new piece of the puzzle of how do planets get to be planets everywhere in the universe. Do you think it will get a more catchy name? I know. I hope so. <laughs> no, I don't think it will at all. <laughs> no. Did you hear about that HR 8799C? Yeah, no. Yeah. Not, not, I don't think it'll be more catchy. It's the, it's, it's the whole, uh, just categorize everything that's out there, give it a number-like name, and if it becomes really, really important, then maybe we'll give it something that people can recognize. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> but anyway, ah, oh, Twit Refugee, you're funny. Planets get methane by getting their own cows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think about those services humor. they have where um, you can name your own star. Name a star. Right? Yeah. And and I just kind of think ahead to when we're going to find one that's super important and someone's going to show up and go, um, that's my star. I named it. It's named <laughs> Judy or whatever. And we just have to say, okay, you named the star. It's named Judy. <laughs> well, aren't most the stars Judy solar system. named after oh, women? <laughs> I feel like that's the majority of what those are bought for. I named yeah. a star after you, baby. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. No, that's it. It's like a Valentine's anniversary type present. I want to name a star Boba Fett. Can I do that? <laughs> yeah, <whatever. laughs> fantastic. But are those actually, like, My where are those Boba recorded? Fett. And who actually, like... I don't know. Show up question. in your scientific They're, data maps, or is it yeah, just ignored? These, <laughs> I, that's a really good question because there is actually there is a naming standard like that they try and follow for like star names, planet names, um, asteroid names, comets. Um, there are there are standards that they follow, and I don't know exactly what the rules are, but the whole buy your own star and give it a yeah. name thing definitely would not follow that. <laughs> Quit Refugee in the uh, chat room is saying, it's a scam! The star isn't named by a scientific registry. But I think yes. when you name it, they tell you what its letter number uh, equivalent is. So, yeah, so you can go so out So at this point, like, I might have bought the naming rights one? for HR 8799C and I would get this right news right next it would be super exciting. That's no, not that. The one next to see the one that's that one. I think. No, which where you're looking over there? No, I was pointing over. Uh, so anyway, one of them up there. I named that. <laughs> it was H R C T W S uh, something. I, it's yours now. Whatever. I thought it was a good idea. Obviously, you don't appreciate it. You're not excited about. It. You're looking in the wrong hemisphere for your stars. It's all ended badly. I wanted a ring. 
<laughs> I couldn't afford the ring <laughs> this year. I could afford. I gave you a whole star. <laughs> okay, like Blair. Don't, don't you know that. there is only one ring? One this ring. We'll never lose to its rule them luster all. in right. our lifetime. That's right. Oh, oh dear. There's some great science stories out there. Uh, a brief uh, story that uh, Brandon Keim over at Wired Science reported on. A parallel micro-universe living in the basalt rocks of Earth's oceanic crust. Uh -huh. Complex uh -huh. microbial ecosystem fueled entirely by chemical reactions with rocks and seawater. Uh -huh. No sunlight required. What? So, uh, really interesting direction researchers are taking this uh, microbial research into what lives in the dirt that can't see the sunlight and is all over our planet. A lot of stuff. Oh, uh, quick joke. How is the Pope like a Higgs boson? Oh, no, I don't know. They both give mass. <laughs> Very good. Um, <laughs> I thought that was going to be easy. <laughs> what, did you expect, wait, a whole bunch of people to uh, suddenly end up clapping for you or something? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was funny. Um, oh, what, oh, it's, uh, olive oil, olive oil. Do not cut out your olive oil in front of your face. Uh, I was late, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> What about, what about olive oil? What about olive oil? Do not cut olive oil out of your date. Uh, out of your date. Out of your uh, diet. It uh, apparently <laughs> makes you feel more full. I have it, heard that before. Yeah. yeah. So people who are cutting out um, potentially fattier foods from their diets are finding that they're still hungry <laughs> at the end of That's it. That's a problem. Where yeah, and then continue to eat. Uh, the uh, yeah they. Studied people over a period of three months. Uh, they had the, the participants ate 500 grams of low-fat yogurt enriched with one of the four fats or oils every day as a supplement to the normal diet. Olive oil had the biggest set uh, satiety. Uh, they, they weren't Steady. hungry. Yeah. <laughs> olive oil <laughs> showed, <laughs> showed a higher concentration of the uh, fullness hormone serotonin in their blood. Subjectively speaking, these participants also reported that they found olive oil yogurt very filling. During the uh, study period, no member of this group recorded an increase in their body fat percentage or their weight. Eat your olive oil, people. Don't cut it out of the diet. Well, it also has omega-3s in it and all sorts of good stuff. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. Good. And there was another study that suggests, I don't, that very recently, I just closed the window, unfortunately, uh, an actual mechanism by which vitamin E might prevent cancer. It's been suspected for a really long time, but not um, actually had, they haven't ha actually had any evidence to, uh, to prove the link. And so now they actually have a mechanism which might be the the way that uh, vitamin E prevents cancer. Hmm. Yeah, interesting health news. But that said, you know, don't overdo it on the olive oil or the vitamin E. Everything in moderation. Talk to your doctor or health advisors before making any changes to your diet. And consult your scientific research on the cutting edge before adhering <laughs> to your doctor's advice. <laughs> Right. They probably haven't read the new stuff. They're still working on uh, what they had in grad school 20 years ago. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. And disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. <laughs> We're not Don't a Don't listen to anything we say, ever. Ever. We disclaim at the beginning <laughs> of the show. Everything we do now, if we could you know, tell people to go jump off a bridge, if they did, we'd be like, but there's a disclaimer at the beginning. Mm. Yeah, so anyway, we're getting to the end of the show. More evidence about uh, four-winged birds flying around in the, the ancient world. So awesome. Yeah, not just micro-raptors, but successive lineages very likely um, had the four-winged flight, uh, maybe with a flapping front, wing, front wings and their legs with feathers that acted something like a glider. And so basically, starting from the trees, gliding down, maybe flapping a little bit to be able to get to another tree. Um, 
yeah. But anyway, lots it seems like it. Yeah, dino birds, four wings, and then to two, and now you know the birds that we know everywhere. On next week's show, once again, we're going to be on Google+. Plus. I'm not going to be here, but everyone else is going to be here. I'm going to be at the San Diego Science Festival. Um, if anyone... Whoop, 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 yeah. Anyone in San Diego, I'm going to be at the Saturday Science Fair. I'm doing something with the Girl Scouts during the day around 2 p.m., 3 p.m., something like that. Uh, so, I don't know. I'll be wandering around. Hope to meet people. Hope to, if you're... If you're there, try and find me. Um, additionally, uh, next week, the show broadcasts YouTube Live. You can find us by following us on all the social media outlets. And you can go to youtube.com slash thisweekinscience. And then you go to browse and then feeds and you can find the live thing. <laughs> it's keep hitting buttons. It's more complicated than it really should be. Shout-outs to everyone who is working, putting in time, or making donations, or purchasing stuff to support us. We really, really appreciate your support. And um, in a period of time when things have been kind of going downhill, suddenly I feel like maybe there's mm. you know, a little bit of a spring in our step. Like things are maybe getting, you know, coming back. Come, coming back, people! Anyway, maybe that's just me. I don't know. I think the minions have been there all along. I think it's I us. <laughs> it starts to fail. Well, sometimes when you're doing something for like 14 years, you know, <laughs> you have good days, you have bad days, a good year, a bad year. You it's know. the teen years. It's going to be like this for a little while longer. Just, <laughs> I know. We're just going to make it through these next couple of years, and then, and then the show will leave the house. It'll be nice. That's right. That's right. Finish it up, Justin. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you for enjoying the show. Uh, Twist is also available as a podcast. You can Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory, and you'll pop up with all the iTunes that we've ever put in that directory. Or if you have an Android device and want some Twist on the move, you can uh, look for the Twist for Droid app in the Android Marketplace. We're also Twist, T-W-I-S, in the, uh, what you going to call it, uh, iPhone device place that's to stuff. right and for more information you can uh, go to our website show notes should be available uh, in the next century at least by 2100 website twist.org mm -hmm. and we want to hear from you email us kirsten at thisweekinscience.com justin at thisweekinscience.com blair baz at gmail.com be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line where your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. You can also contact us on the Twitter, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, at Blair's Menage Ray. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a tip on a good place to go gold panning, please let us know. Without little kids, right? And we'll be back here next week, and we hope that you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. Darn it. Why didn't it work? I'm hitting the wrong button. <laughs> Jeez.
this week in science. Science, 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 science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just get understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. jeopardy. So the key is remembering which mouse you're clicking. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I'm sitting here clicking my mouse. I'm like, why isn't the music playing? Oh, yeah. I go over here. Too many buttons. Too many control panels. I just need it consolidated. Or an audio specialist. Right. <laughs> Was this a wino show? I don't think it was a wino mm -mm. show. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. No, no, no. I mean, I have been drinking wine, but... Really? Really? Science Foodie, you're welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Everyone who's watched today, uh, tonight, thank you for watching. Really appreciate it. Um, question. Okay, I got a book. Life on the Brink. It's a, it's a, snow leopard. A, it's mm -hmm. snow leopard. Environ, Very nice. Environmentalists confront overpopulation. Would we like to have an interview about overpopulation? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, would, like, would we like to do that? Snow leopards? Uh, no, it's about humans. Human. I think there yeah. aren't that many of them. I don't think we should. We don't need to start culling. That's for sure. No, He's don't. overreactionary. I saw the snow leopard at the zoo, Blair. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, 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 oh. That reminds me. So next week, uh -huh. uh, no, not next week, early next month, uh -huh. I'm going to be doing the kind of thing I did today with a uh, kindergartner's uh, field uh -huh. trip to the Sacramento Zoo. Ooh, cool. Yeah. My friend Jamie works Very at the exciting. Sacramento Zoo. Nice. Jamie? Jamie? Jamie. 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 I don't know if you know Jamie. I don't know Jamie, but... um. If Jamie Wilson. Okay. The, the I'll, I'll page her. Maybe, yeah. I can, maybe I can connect you through Facebook or something. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. That would be totally right. Yeah. And I told this story. I told this story. Um, I have, maybe I said this last week because it was, yeah, well, I probably did, about getting bit by the ostrich mm -hmm. to, to the kindergartners, and they were all, like, horrified at first. And then my daughter, who's, like, you know, she was like, but they don't have teeth, so Papa was just overreacting. Well, when children remember stuff, I tell them. 
the best. No, she totally does. She um, I I I said you were back in town. She's like, maybe maybe next time when we go, the giraffe will eat the banana. Yes, maybe. She was like still upset that she didn't that the giraffe didn't eat the banana. She was snubbed, snubbed by the giraffe. Go Zader. Go make your fall asleep appointment. Do it, do it. All these people. Twelve, twelve. I guess it's not twelve, so you can't, you know, put some kind of cosmic importance on the time. Just yeah, stay up till thirteen, thirteen with us. Yeah. No. No. And I, I not do not. I am predicting. No I am predicting no. thirteen, thirteen, thirteen is the end of the world. <laughs> Just because. Just because that's what I'd like to do. Okay. Um, interesting stuff. Did did other people say, did people in the chat room say whether or not they'd want to get an interview about the popula overpopulation? It's a tough I would very thing. much like that. I know you I, would. I would too. But I just, <laughs> you know, I have my own opinions, which I think would be, you know, fun I to know, interview. I a per fun really, perspective really to interview. Promise. From. It's one of those subjects that Gord says yes. Is the book out already? Yes, it is out. This is, uh, yeah, I got the paperback version. So I'm write it's it down right now. Life on the Brink. Life on the Brink. And, and it's what's uh, this edited by. Name? Huh? What's this guy's name? Philip Cafaro, C A F A R O, and Eileen Christ, C R I S T. So the thing is, I mean, if we can deliberate why we're having this conversation about overpopulation, we're talking about humans. It's, it's a, I mean, it's a tough subject because while on one hand I agree that most of the people on the planet um, I wouldn't want to live too close with, I do. I live on the same planet as them. And it's kind of hard to say, like, well, people should stop, you know, having kids and being people and doing what people do. We're just an animal that's going to do what any other animal is going to do. Uh, so, we, I mean, we're already uh, unsustainable without science, you know. Right. Um, so, we're out of balance with planet Earth nature. Yeah. Oh, we've been out of balance. We should well, have there's, done... there's a difference between saying people, we shouldn't be using medicine to keep people alive and saying that things should be done to make sure people don't come into being when they're not wanted. Huh? Which I know is like a political statement. But I think that you can say, you can make efforts to correct overpopulation. Mm -hmm. First of all, without making any change to those kinds of things, you have to change the way you affect this planet as a population. But then on top of that, there are ways to affect your population size without taking a direct uh, approach. Right. But, I, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I still think birth control, I still tend to think of it as um, a matter of education, a matter of choice. Mm -hmm. But I don't tend to think of it in terms of overpopulation. Just because for all the people that we have on the planet, um, you know, I think a vast majority would like to have a couple of kids. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so even with birth control and putting it off for a few years and doing it a little sooner, like in Western culture, a lot of it might be choosing the right moment. Um, other parts of the world, it could be an economic uh, boon to be able to not get pregnant uh, every other year. Right? But... I, I don't know if that's really the big conversation about population. The big conversation about population comes down to how do we not affect the planet that we're living on as mm -hmm. we're expanding at this increasingly mm -hmm. rapid rate. Right. And right. we can't. We won't. And we won't affect the way that people live uh, without really drastic changes. You know, I'm, I'm looking at I'm looking at this this suburb that's going up all around. And yeah. So what in this massive one... houses that are going to be incredibly energy inefficient just because of their vast size and yeah, they've so... all got front lawns that they're not going to use but are going to pour fresh water yeah. into it. It's just <laughs> yeah. Here here in the book they say 
if we do this in the fetal position, like yeah, ah! probably, probably. Oh, yeah. So they say hope lies in humanity's coming to realize the immensity of what we are irretrievably, irretrievably losing, which is not resources. Hope lies in the fact that we are native to Earth. We have the potential of understanding that we are losing our own family. So, how many people can Earth support? It depends on what we mean when we say Earth. The Earth transmogrified into a resource domain, I would wager, can support many billions of people. It already does. But Earth is a biosphere with abundant numbers and kinds of free non-humans with connected and thriving wild places with a richly textured biogeography with domesticated earthlings not chained to a sickening industrial food system a little bit of bias in there mm. with horticultures healthy for people and friendly to wildlife with human denizens not living in terror of the specters of hunger war and rape and with the world's oceans allowed to re rebound into a semblance of their former largesse and beauty that earth can support far fewer than billions of people. People who will almost undoubtedly want to enjoy many of the amenities of the consumer age. Mm -hmm. And so they, uh, they say, let's call the first resource earth and the second abundant earth. If human beings choose abundant earth, then we also choose embarking on a speedy journey toward a declining world population. And in the straight and simple words of Alan Wiseman, Quote, the intelligent solution would require the courage and the wisdom to put our knowledge to the test. It would be poignant and distressing in many ways, but not fatal. It would henceforth limit every human female on Earth capable of bearing children to one. No, 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 no. There's a better solution, and I have it. First of all, to the industrializ uh, industrialization, the food, blah, blah, blah. I would take McDonald's over Bushmeat any day. I <laughs> think most of us would choose the same. McDonald's is very popular. <laughs> the solution isn't less human beings on the planet. It's not a smaller population. We can double, triple, quadruple the population of this earth and live within the means we are now. We only need to make one single alteration, and science is rapidly approaching the point in which we can do this. We need to all be three feet tall. <laughs> once, once we do this, We'll eat less, we'll require less uh, room to, right. for our housing, use less resources, create less waste. We'll just do everything we're doing so, now, but we'll be so doing it on the we're going the other way. Scale. We're getting taller. And so we just need to promote sexual selection towards people of smaller stature. No, no, no. Genetic manipulation. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. No, That's we need not to... crossing any moral boundaries or anything. No. <laughs> well, well, you know, the moral boundary already got crossed. Honestly, it has. And this is, what, this is a little bit more serious tact on it when I'm saying that the current population is unsustainable without science. It means that we are already in sort of like the bubble years of like an economic boom when everything seems great and everything's growing, everything's going up, but it's built on, um, it's being propped up completely by science. I mean, and I don't mean recent science. I mean, you go back a little ways. We couldn't support the population of the planet as it is today if mm -hmm. we didn't have frozen food, if we didn't have refrigeration, yeah. if we didn't have the vast, you know, the petroleum industry getting heavily involved in farming. Uh, yeah. We wouldn't it have just, the ability it, to create the food, to store the food, to transport the food. Yeah, it makes and, food a more persistent and um, some and you know you're going to get it. You're going to have it. Yeah, yeah. It's everywhere. And, and, of course, then this puts pressure on the fresh water uh, and all these other things. But we're already, we're already past the point of uh, sustainability to a very large degree. Our f entire food industry is yeah. heavily energy yeah. dependent, heavily. And if we don't come up with a new energy source, uh, we won't be able to continue because we're going to have issues anyway because of water. That's going to we're going to have issues because of water. Chance. That's that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, okay. But if we create the new energy systems, we can desalinize. We got big oceans out there. We can do stuff. Uh, but if we're talking about overpopulation in terms of impacts on the rest of the the life forms on planet Earth, none of these solutions solve that. They make those problems worse. So the only way. The only possible way to continue to increase in numbers and reduce our imprint on this planet is to force genetic alteration for smaller people. <laughs> 
I I propose that we also um, instead of doing a selection for larger cows, larger pigs, that we go to smaller cows and pigs. They eat less food. They don't need as much space. Exactly, and then we'd have more of them. And we have more of them. Right. That's well, exactly. And, what yeah, we're, and if, but if, it if you talk about the powers of smaller. ten in. Uh, I know. In tertiary levels, mm -hmm. just cut everyone's meat by half. You don't even have to turn everyone into vegetarians. Just cut everyone's meat consumption in half. There'll be more than enough food for everyone. Yep. Uh, well, You're right there. Mm -hmm. But that's only in the United States. No, everywhere. Because a lot of because, places don't eat that much meat. Well, yeah. but if you take... I mean, we'll we'll have so much food. We'll be throwing it away. We can send it to the people that need the food. I already do. Um, <laughs> but the you know, if you take an acre and you raise uh, plant matter on it for consumption, mm -hmm. or you raise cows on that acre of land, you feed ten times as many people off right. of the plants than on the on the cows. Right. Yeah, ten times. The other solution Crazy. is just Science Island, where those of us <laughs> who want to live comfortably with each other, can just pretend the rest of the world la, la, doesn't exist. We'll send out messages explaining what's going on wrong in their society. Meanwhile, la, la, la. I was la, thinking la. earlier, you know, we were talking about the coronavirus story, that we could actually have coronavirus island. <laughs> Welcome to coronavirus island. Ah. We probably have all these people showing up that thought it was like a beer sponsored yeah. event. I had like, when I took a virology class oh, in, in college, now. we had to do a model of a virus and someone brought in a, can a bottle of corona. He said he did a coronavirus. Uh, so oh, he got full credit because the teacher thought it was hilarious. Right Meanwhile, on. I spent 6 hours making a virus and I was like <laughs> Damn you. Unacceptable. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you made a virus? Right. Well, a, uh, a model about this big out of uh, construction paper, markers, and uh, paper clips. Wow. wow. I want to do paper mache. Maybe I can do a paper mache virus. Mm hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Not this week, yeah. though. Not uh, this will week. Science Island have a one child policy, Justin? <laughs> if it's an island, if we're literally talking about an island, that is a very finite space. <laughs> I'm just saying. No. <laughs> I think that, you know, any that got three. Uh, intelligent oh. yeah, Justin Justin's on he's way past that already. <laughs> I wouldn't be allowed on the island. I know. With all my children. Although, actually, some of my children might choose not to be on the island. Mm -hmm. It's true. Wait, you don't have, like, high-speed internet yet? Um, yeah, call me when you got it, Pops. <laughs> Plus, wait. if you're thinking several generations my, ahead, you're going to have to have an exchange. My phone doesn't have any coverage? Yeah. <laughs> well, you're going to have to send people away and bring new people in for every generation, or you're going to have an, mm -hmm. a genetic bottlenose effect on Science Island. Yeah. Bottlenose? Well, yeah. <laughs> like a dolphin? Yeah. It's a genetic bottlenose. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, a prop, I think a proper uh, population size, before it starts to get really too far out of control, mm -hmm. is probably somewhere between 150 and 300. Anything really much larger than that can, I think, get a little bit less... I don't know. Uh, uh, cohesive. You start to end up with more segmented, fragmented, different societies within your society. So just stay together as a tribe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then, you know, you look at uh, nations like Denmark, Sweden, um, that have populations that like to leave their country and don't have overpopulation. They actually stay pretty static. You know, uh, so you know, get, get so what you do is you raise your children with a with a strong interest in the outside world. <laughs> hope they leave. <laughs> yeah. You're eighteen years old. It's time to leave the island. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a rite of passage. I've never heard of this before. Oh yeah, yeah. No, we spring it on you. That's why it's a rite of passage. It's one of these becoming an adult things. So, uh, bye. <laughs>
Yeah. No, I don't. I don't think. I don't. We've taught you everything you need to know. Leave. Right. <laughs> this I, conversation I, I, is just begging for lost references, but I'm just not gonna. I'm not taking the bait. <laughs> oh, I, think I was thinking did. more of like uh, the Hunger Games. Oh, <laughs> that too. <laughs> Send the kids out. Fight. Yeah. yeah well, what is regular society anyway? But yeah. a giant Hunger Game. So, uh, Science Island, or as I'm more fond of, really the Science Mountain Island. Um, which would become an island in the future. It's a mountain now. It's an elevated area now. But in the future, it would be an island because of the global warming. I don't think we need to worry about population at this point. I think we probably have about 15 to 30 people who would actually be interested in mm -hmm. joining us on Science Island. Maybe a few more would show up that we, we haven't heard from directly. But I think we'll be all right. Well, we have a pre-screening process because otherwise, I'm not sure I want to be on the island. <laughs> pre-screening? Yeah, we we'll get. We have to get that. Uh, what is it? That screening they do for the psychopaths? Yeah, there's that. Gotta do that one. There should be an extensive interview process and make sure that they actually have a skill that is um, something not, that we could. But not too extensive. Or am I grandfathered in? <laughs> wait, 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 hang on. You're grandfathered in. It's okay, your... yeah, yeah. Very expensive. <laughs> They've got to bring something to the table because otherwise, you know, we can't have. I've already got, uh, you know, <laughs> I've already, already got make it up, do nothing all day in this down. Mm -hmm. We don't need more of that. Hmm. Um. Art, art 17, Art 17, uh, company I had, Art 19, why do I keep getting it wrong? Mm -hmm. This is not, this isn't, this does not bode well, I don't know. Um, art 19, I spoke with them today, today they're a, a startup company that's interested in making money off of podcasts, but in the process, getting podcasts to make money themselves, so that we could make money. Um mm -hmm. And they have said that they don't get in the way of the RSS stream so that we wouldn't have to change our RSS feed. It would just, they would insert somewhere in the pathway. And someday somebody's going to explain to me what the hell a RSS feed means. Because I don't have any way to real, feed my computer. Put real in. simple syndication. Ooh. Oh, is that what it means? Then why'd they make it sound so <laughs> complicated? I know, it sounds very <laughs> techy. Yeah. Um, oh, RSS. Is all about, I'm like right? looking for a cable in the back of my computer. I don't see one that's marked RSS. I don't know where I how I get that in there now. Yeah. Um, the the main thing is that they they will set up like they'll they'll take our back catalog and import it into what they do. They'll give it all help help us do new meta tags so that things search better on Google and other search engines. Um, and then they do a, they have a premium content plan, which they have said will cost $7.99 a month. And for the premium content plan, um, you would I get access, yeah, you'd get access to the entire, the back catalog of twists. So what would be free in the freemium part of the model would be the last the two premium? months, yeah. The last two. The, the last. Sorry. It would be the last two months of the show, or the last eight episodes, whichever Great. is shorter. And well, that's and we've talked about that's perfect. Not, which is perfect. We've, we've talked about they're doing something exactly like this. Yeah, and so they would, um, and they'll put advertising on it, and so we can make money from advertising. We can also make money from subscriber fees. Um. So, I don't know. I would love Minion chat room comments on this. They're not listening heard. to us anymore. Yeah, they're no, having they're their own, own conversations. Thing, which happens all the time. I know. So, so SEO ads, what? Um, yeah, like, it's fine. I mean, I, I, think, I think I'm much more dedicated to the folks who are tuning in on a, you know, regular monthly basis. It's called This Week in Science. It's kind yeah. of supposed to be mm -hmm. current. And it's the archive is the archive. And you can delve yeah. into the archive yeah. anytime you do. I don't know about the monthly fee thing, though, because it just sort of seems like 
But it's not it's not just for twists. So you get uh, the premium access to the entire art oh. team. Uh, right, which catalog. means we don't so, get all that money. So how no. How much do we get? Like, how many podcasts are there? Like, 2,000 podcasts, and you get <laughs> one two thousandth of seven ninety nine, And it's like, well, that's not good either. <laughs> well, it, I don't know. It could be good. I don't know. It's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. Start. Which is basically where we are. It might not be better than nothing. Sometimes nothing is good. I just I would wouldn't want to take away much more than than that. Like if it was only the most current episode, I would feel like yeah. No, I mean it's the last be, two that months. Would be real rough. Yeah, that's yeah, the that's last two good. months of episodes are free. So I mean you're really getting for a you know current events type show like ours. Mm -hmm. You still ha will have access, and you'll have access through whichever views iTunes or you know whatever. A feed reader mm -hmm. to collect twists. Um, but how do we know, like, so, like... And if I sign a contract, it's only a one-year exclusive contract. Okay. So, okay. And, a and after one year, so it goes into effect when they launch our show on their network through their app or whatever. Um... I don't think I'd have to leave. No, we wouldn't have to leave Google+. Plus. We still record. We do the podcast the way that we want to do the podcast. Um, and then, you know, I edit it and publish it. And it'll basically go, everything will happen the same way that it normally does for all of you. Except that there might be advertisements added. And uh, you might not be able to access episodes older than eight weeks unless you pay for their subscription mm -hmm. so I have to say I listen to a lot of podcasts and I, I don't think there's almost any that I listen to anymore that don't have ads somewhere yeah I know um, and then Goldazator says and when they go out of business yeah that, can, that nullifies the contract <laughs> yeah. so, so, what would happen to our YouTube recordings though those would all come down also or the videos would still be available. Well, the, the videos would still be available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, as far as I know, it would all the the only thing that this contract would cover would be the podcast. Right. So, the pod because this is its own the the video the live thing that we do and what's on YouTube it's its own beast. And so then we edit eight, it and do the podcast, and that's different. So eight episodes would still be available on iTunes also, but only the most eight recent. Yes. Okay. And yeah. then it would say, like, somewhere on the i the page for our show in iTunes, if you want to read some or hear something later, go to this website. Yeah. Okay. So. So anyway, it's uh, the, the the main thing that I am questioning is this is a, a an upstart startup. Um, you know, they need funding to get their tech working, and they're trying to, you know get buzz and hype behind what they're doing and make it happen, um, which is great. But at the same time, you know, do I want to be a, a part of that or do I want to be a part of something that is more proven yet might not have as big a pull? I don't know. I don't know. Because if, if we go with Art19, then, you know, we don't sell our own ads. We have to do their ads only, you know. But I don't like selling ads anyway, so <laughs> it's all good. Mm. Yeah, but they ha and they say with their uh, there are neat aspects their, to their technology. They're trying to create stuff where, with the podcast, we can time code stuff. So we say, you know, somebody's listening through the Art Nineteen app on their smartphone. Um, that we can say right now, if you click your phone, you can answer this survey and there will be a button that pops up on the phone. So we can, like, time code things to happen, or we can say, um, you know, oh, hey, if you're listening right now and want to support us, why don't you buy a T-shirt? Just press, press the, uh, click the button on your, on, your, on your phone right now in the app, and it'll, like, be there for people to, like, instant buy. Like, kind of neat ideas. I love the ideas. I hope it all works, but, you know. 
Uh, Matt and Joe, no, the proceeds would not go to fund Science Island. That would be for, they would fund this week in science. Um, the yes. Science That's Island uh, startup fund <laughs> is actually going to be going in with me on a gold mine somewhere in the Sierras and working it uh, and trying to find enough gold to buy more uh, island land somewhere. More island land. It's an investment in a gold mine, yeah. There's more, you know, I, you know what I want to find out? There's like a, well, this is some other thing. Yeah. Supposedly there's a hidden river of gold under the Central Valley. What? Yeah. From an ancient river that's buried below all the sediment, which totally makes sense because there was, the Sierras were, there was this giant glacier there. And if you look at the top of the Sierras, it's all like volcanic rock. All the granite, all these round boulders that we see is from when this glacier moved out, right? The whole Central Valley is sediment. And so you figured this glacier was here, and it was tearing down through the through the Sierras and leaking out all the gold and rolling it down into the Central Valley, and it's been covered over and over and over in time. So there could be a massive gold streak lying somewhere buried under the Central Valley. We can find it and like you know mine it. It's probably a mile down or something though. Right. I don't know when you hit bedrock in the Central Valley. I bet it's way down there, though. There were stories told that would make your blood run cold. Dad, burn it. Land. <laughs> don't give me no session fresh. What was that? Oh, that was such an awesome poem. Robert W. Service wrote some amazing poems, um, like, about around the time of um, around the time of the gold rush, and he was out there and writing this. It just um, he wrote some amazing poetry. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Ah, here we go. Oh, Johnny Cash did a version of the cremation of Sam McGee. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to put this link up. Everybody needs to go watch it because I can't show everybody. That's cool. If Johnny Cash did a version, that means that's really freaking cool, right? Oh, that's a terrible link. That's no good. Come back. Come back. YouTube, I need to uh, update my plugin. Copy, copy, copy. Chat. Yeah. The cremation of San McGee. What is the? There, there are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that would make your blood run cold. The northern lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of the Lake LaBarge. I cremated Sam McGee. Hmm. I love this poem. It's awesome. Awesome. One of my favorite poems in the whole world. So I suggest I listen to it, read it, love it, is good. Mm-hmm. I think he also wrote one about the Mudville Nine. I remember my sixth grade teacher used what to read What is the Mudville the, Nine? I've never heard of this. The Stockton baseball team. Oh, it's a Stockton story? Uh-huh, it's a Stockton story. Yeah, my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Finney, he used to recite it in the middle of class. And he'd change the ending sometimes. Like sometimes he'd make it have a happy ending and sometimes he'd let it have a sad ending, which was kind of fun. Hmm. <laughs> what, was another one? What, was a, what was another one of the poems that I love? Um, Robert Service poems. That is not what I want. The Shooting of Dan McGrew, that's another good one. <laughs> this was, he, was an, he was awesome. Awesome poems, I tell you. Sorry, sidetrack, super sidetrack here. Bloop, bleep, bloop, bloop. So, 
it sounds like everybody's saying, go ahead and do the Art 19 thing. If no, I'm not. I didn't say that at all. I don't trouble. Think, no, wait. No, I didn't. That's, <laughs> hang on. Yeah, I, Casey at the Bat, Rebar. That's the one about the Medville 9. Casey at the Bat is from mm -hmm. Stockton? Yes. A that's Stockton. a famous story. Right, because... Robert Service was all over California up into Alaska. He was doing mining for gold and he was doing he was doing also he was just traveling all over and writing poems and Casey at the Bat. I think he spent some time in Stockton. Wow. Mm -hmm. So on this whole idea with the uh nineteen people. I need. To, I want to see number. What are the numbers? What are the they hard numbers? What they are they saying? Well, they don't have any numbers. I mean, it's the What's normal. The percentages? It's the normal fifty-fifty rev share. So. so it's a rev share. So the people who are signing up for this have somehow tagged that they're signing up because of our archive. Yeah. How? I don't know. Mm. <laughs> That's, That's the, a good question. Well, the, uh, here's what I would assume. That when they download or listen to something, it catalogs it. And then whatever, like if I pay for the service and I listen to four podcasts in a month, then my seven ninety nine goes to that four podcasts. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty easy to track what I'm downloading if I have to sign into my account that I've paid for to download a podcast. So and then I mean, is that it, sounds. But then is it by time? Because uh, mm -hmm. say somebody's got a bunch of twenty-minute podcasts and they listen to twice as many of those, they would still have listened to more twists. I don't think that's what they're going to be doing, but I don't know. I, this is still just so many questions. So many questions. I know. I fly away. <laughs> <laughs> and you said it was a year, the the commitment? Yeah. You said? Yeah, it's a year from, you know, the, it'll be, we sign the contract and say, yes, we want to do this with you, and then I have to send them files so that they can put all of our catalog in mm -hmm. their database, and then we have to do all sorts of, like, meta tag stuff, which I was like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> That's a, I have a big catalog. <laughs> We have a catalog that goes back a decade. Yeah. You cray-cray. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is a good point in the chat room. Would they get coupons to the twist store? Hmm. Ooh. That's a good idea. That's yeah. a good idea. Something like else that, that uh, yeah, I've realized now from reading the chat room, Stockton used to be called Mudville. I think that was a much more appropriate name for it in some way, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, mean, I can see why they made the switch, but really, you know. Automator. Oh. Yeah. Um. So, can we have Science Island yet? Because I really want to start. Working <laughs> on it. I really want to start working on Science Island. Kiki, I wanted to ask you what your opinion. Yes. on doing a remote b broadcast would be. How how do you mean? Like if what we are went the details? to a if we I haven't formulated any yet. <laughs> but if I did the footwork and we were able to do a show from an interesting place. Yeah, I'd love it. Potentially that people could come and see live. Yeah, we've done it before. Um and so yeah, I'd love where, it. Where have if, we done it before? Didn't we do it? At uh, or did we just record it at the uh, Cal Academy? Remember, we went to Cal Academy of Science. Uh, yeah, and we did a show but, there, and then we also did a show during uh, Skeptical over in Berkeley. Oh, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I gotta start. I gotta stop doing heavy narcotics on the uh, out missions. <laughs> <laughs> just screws with your memory. <laughs> now I'm starting to remember this. Yeah, but yes, I love the idea. If you, okay. um, yeah, I love the idea of doing remote broadcasts. If we can, you know, uh, schedule stuff that we can all make it to, probably mm -hmm. weekends, I would imagine, or I don't know about Justin's schedule. It probably is when he sells the most cars. Broadcasting again for the third week in a row in Blair's room. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, so I don't. Blair's want had her like, own set of uh, of bleachers installed in her true. room. Yes. <laughs> so I, I don't want to like say anything. We talked about it last week when you were with Kai, but at this time every week, opportunity is, is the nightlife at the Academy of Sciences. Yes, which I have just I've been uh, just recently connected to the people who run nightlife. Oh. Via somebody oh. at Gal Academy. So there you go. So this ties in very nicely with your plans. <laughs> yes. Well, because um, I saw recently, I get their email every week of what's in yeah. nightlife, and I was like, oh shucks, I can't go. And they have they've had podcast tapings there before, other podcasts. Mm -hmm. So I know they have the framework set up that it could be done. I think pretty easily. Yeah. So. Um, and they just had robot night a couple weeks ago. <laughs> that would have been fun. I love it. Ooh, Justin, if maybe this is something that maybe you could get into. Um, I had an idea for a live show if we wanted to do something different and fun. Be like a game show where we get people from the audience to be be part of it. And the game show idea is um, is uh, is it. What is it? I can't remember. I, I, you can probably come up with a better name. You're probably you're good at it. But basically, good for the future or bad, you know, where we take modern technologies and then go back and find the scientific research that, you know, some little nugget of research that ended up leading to the technology. So, and then in the game show, all you give is the clue of the original research. Hmm. And so then the people have to vote on, or they have to choose whether or not they think that research is going to go on to be something good for society in the future or something that's bad for society in the future. Bonus could, round, you bet your life. You bet uh, your life. Based <laughs> on the molecular structure you see before you, is this an inert substance or is this a poison? <laughs> choose one vial, drink it down. On, you bet your life. Woo! Insider doesn't like it. He says it sounds too specific. No, 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 no. Um, I think it, it would no, be, it be one of those fun things that's like, uh, because nobody necessarily knows the answer, but I would give right. them the multiple choice. Here's the bit of research that took place. Did this lead to this, this, guy, this, this, or this? Right, right. And right. then they, they get to vote and pick which one of those three actual discoveries was can be sourced directly back. Right. Yeah, yeah. that I like. That could work. That's a better. That's a better use of it. Can, can right. I be? Can I be in a glittery dress and play Vanna White? Yes. <laughs> that would make me so happy. Can I also? I like it. Can I do that yes, too? Of course. <laughs> glittery dresses dress. for everyone. <laughs> a brand new glittery dress. <laughs> I think it would be a lot of fun. People in the chat rooms like this idea. Yes. Oh, to be grilled by Jackson Fly, says Ulysses. <laughs> <laughs> to be grilled. I think it would be I, a lot of fun to put like to put a game show together like that. I think it would be fun. I think it would yeah. be a blast. Huh. Didn't we have what was the thing that we were doing a long time ago with the uh, was it uh, it was this cryptozoological thing. We did I think we did mm -hmm. it once on the show. Yeah. It's like what's what's uh, what was real? Uh, ten foot penguins or an eleven foot gorilla? And the answer was ten foot penguins. Ten foot penguin actually existed. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, maybe there was an eleven foot gorilla. I don't think <laughs> I don't remember hearing about it, but there was a ten foot penguin uh, discovered in South Africa. There were giant lemurs, but I don't think they were 11 feet tall. South Africa? Was it South Africa or was it uh, Southern Australia? Where were the 10-foot penguins? I don't even know. But they existed. That's all I need to do. That's yeah. enough. Yeah. Yeah, Strength says, sounds like the clues would need to not be Googleable. Well, the, the idea is that if we did the game show during live performances, that we would have members of the audience and they wouldn't be able to use their smartphones or Google it. So because they'd be know. blindfolded. Yes! <laughs> 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 and have their hands tied behind their backs. Yeah. <laughs> this game is taking a very awkward direction. Very <laughs> Oh dear, I love it. 
Yeah. What was the new thing? Giant camels in Antarctica or something like that? Whoa. There was some recent camel study. They, they found camels some in some giant camels in some really weird place. Or maybe it was just giant Googling. camels. <laughs> yeah. Giant camels. Giant camels. High <laughs> Arctic. <laughs> Kildazator says, Dr. Geeky has strange game ideas. Why is that strange? <laughs> By the way, Geeky, like the how idea did of get your take on this? Um, hog tying contestants. What? Your old karate dojo. Hiya, Radness Karate. Uh, doing uh, Taekwondo. Yes, Taekwondo. Not karate. <sighs> Yes. I find this very confusing. Taekwondo. It, it, I forget what it means, but uh, it's something in Korean. <laughs> <laughs> Karate is something to do with the way of the dance. And... Punching and kicking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm forgetting everything I used to know. But you, you can still bust boards, right? I haven't tried in a long time, but probably. They think we should make this part of the game show. Blair, make a note. Whoa, Here's physics time. police Here's is here. The next Empty live hand. Event. Thank Houston you. is going to break boards at the next live event. Oh, good God. <laughs> I'm writing it down. <laughs> yeah. Houston is breaking boards. Yeah. Karate is Japanese. We have uh, Taekwondo, which is Korean, and then uh, Kung Fu, mm. Gong Fu, which is Chinese. Gong Fu. Mm. Yes. Which is, Gong Fu is kicking. It's something to do with feet. I don't remember. Yeah, Taekwondo is mainly kicks as well, yes. There's a lot of punching, takedowns, and other stuff. I mean, all of these so, forms. When I'm learning when I'm learning kickboxing. I think, yes, thank you, Gord. It was not specified. Yes. Okay, go ahead, Blair. Kickboxing is what mostly? Painful. <laughs> I kicking because and punching. The people that do my kickboxing class also do a martial arts class that's almost exactly the same. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember what it is. And I feel very bad that I don't recall what it is. Jiu-jitsu, ninjitsu. Muay Thai kickboxing is... Um, it's a lot of kicking. Oh. I mean, they box, but it's a lot of kicking and then um, leg holds. And there's... Mm -hmm. You don't ever want to fight in Thailand, Muay Thai. No! <laughs> it's not Don't on my to-do do list. Don't do it. They'll break your legs. <laughs> no, I think I would still go to the, if I was to, you know, entertain the idea of being combative at all, I think I would entertain somewhere between Bruce Lee's ethic of always trying not to fight and Indiana Jones guy doing swirly things with a sword and oh. shoot him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm not into, but I don't like fighting, so. Aikido is except, really oh, good. Except when I watch Bruce Lee. When I watch Bruce Lee movies, I really like fighting. Yes. I really do. I really love fighting, but when I see, only when I really watch Bruce Lee movies. The rest of the movies where there's fighting, I'm like, you know, people punching and kicking. I think my... camels were 30% larger than normal camels. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> and they were in the high 30% larger. The high and they Arctic. were living with polar bears and walruses. Mm -hmm. Right? In the Arctic. That's crazy. Well, uh, have you what? seen... Um... Why were they there? And why were they so big? No, no. Look, Did they have good question. Have you seen the Mongolian <laughs> camel? Uh, what? But that's that's Mongolian. Mongolian. It's like, huh? Are those just, they're just Bactrian, right? They're huge and hairy. Yeah, Bactrian camels are pretty big. Yeah, but these are bigger than that. But they're, yeah. I mean, they, yeah. if you look at that, you wonder, how did the camel ever become a desert creature with that much hair on it? Well, the hair actually mm. protects from heat also. Mm. Camel go everywhere. Camel don't care. That's true. <laughs> Just, hmm. just the pachyderm. What? Is Automator really this awesome? Oh. What? what? What are you talking about? What happened? What's metadata? Oh, by the way, speaking of 
data and stuff. Mm. Do we have a back thing that can show? Remember how I used to look, love looking at the numbers? A bacula. We're looking at the show numbers. <laughs> dissecting the show numbers. We still have that, yes. We still have the numbers. I don't have any access to the, to any numbers. To I will send you. I will send you. I like to geek out on some numbers someday soon. Yeah, our, our numbers are down a bit because we've. Uh, I have been irregular in post and posting the podcast and publishing, so we've lost a lot there. But we've also gained a lot of uh, viewers in YouTube. So. Mm -hmm. hmm. I just cause I'd like to see the numbers because if we're really down to forty people, then I'm going to keep doing the show because I know them all by name now. Yes. <laughs> yes. There are more than 40 people who, who listen to the show. I know, I know, I know. There are how many what? what? <laughs> well, what's always funny, what's always funny to me is, is like, whenever we do one of these big But they're all things, in Canada. <laughs> no, whenever we do one of these big move things, like we did the whole, um, the This Week in Geek uh, network we were doing for a while. We, Twit. Yeah. Yeah. The, it was like... <laughs> Like when we, when like that ended, like all like the regular podcast listeners were like, "What's this weekend? What? What are you even yeah. talking about? Like we've never heard of this stuff before." Yeah, because they like, weren't into a, the live show. No, right. there's a massive, the vast majority of our audience never listens to the show live. Mm -hmm. They never hear the after show. Yep. They never care because we never mention where we're really broadcasting, or they don't know, or they don't care. It's meaningless. It's not the show. So most of most of uh, most of our listeners don't know what we look like still either. They didn't even know there was a video version out there. Mm -hmm. We they signed up for our you know uh, iTunes feed back in two thousand and six or two thousand and five and never looked back. Yep. Because you like us. You really, really like us. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 10 o'clock. Ah, oh, no. Physics police now knows what we look like. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they won't know what I look like. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, we should update that, uh, Kirsten. It's fine. I can no, be no, 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 no. Blair brings up a valid, voice. valid point. <laughs> no, um, we should probably update the uh, iTunes photo to one where I look less French. <laughs> you might have to provide that photo yourself. <laughs> I kind of like the yet yeah, the iTunes photo is not as recent as other. Not to Joe, stop that! Don't say things like that. What are you doing? <laughs> no. Martha Joe just said that he started listening to the show back in high school and is now twenty. <laughs> I want to see this troll action. What are they talking about? Troll? What trolls? We have YouTube trolls. Yeah. Oh, That's I, cool. was... I no, it's fine. I love trolls. I removed a bunch of comments earlier. Oh. There was somebody in the comments. I don't know if there have been more what comments, but I'm, there was somebody who was just putting a bunch of text from some story or something. Repetitively, repetitively oh, it's as like comments, a robo. and it was robo. yeah, but it was like erotic stuff. So it was. Oh, know. did you save it? Is it any, is it good? No, it was not good. Oh, I was like, right, uh, this needs to go away. So I blocked the user and removed the comments. Mm -hmm. So. Hello. Wow. I heard so myself. Bit, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> the modern Stone Age science show. What, Michael Jobin? Who? What's he trying to do? <clears throat> I'm going to follow you, Michael Jobin. <laughs> Who are you? What are you <laughs> doing in my YouTubes? So... I have an idea that could turn this show into like like a mega super everything show. I will see you on the Googles. Mm. We could charge by the Maybe hour the and stay on twenty four hours a day.
24 hours a day, I don't want to do that. No. I have stuff to do. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I have other things that I like to do. Really? I, yeah, I have lots of other interests. I have this really cool part-time job I'll right now. I'll do it now. by myself then. This just in, this just in, breaking news, breaking news. This is fascinating stuff coming in from the world of science. And then like 14 to 30 hours later. Do 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 the thing with the sound. Yeah, um, more things that are probably on this page. I can't read them anymore because my eyes have gone bad from trying to stay awake this long. To four days in, no sleep. Leak de bloop de block. <laughs> yeah, Justin. From experience, I know that you'll just fall asleep in hour nine because you've. Had too many of your your beers. Your it was key, your Keystone Lights. It was it was Keystone. <laughs> no. um, it was an attempt to do a, both a drinking challenge and a twenty-four poorly, hour poorly executed, show. Poorly hey, executed. I made it more than nine hours. I think I made it a good because it was a twenty-something hour show, right? Twenty-one hour show. Mm -hmm. I think I made it like through like. 12 or 13 hours, mm. I think, at least. Michael Jobin worked with NASA Outreach. Mm. Cool. Cred the joints cred. crack when you move, Sounds like, always? Maybe. <laughs> what? That was Blair said that. Mm, what? Your yeah. joints crack when you move. Yeah, yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> Mine do only when I'm doing uh, Bruce Lee style uh, Fu <laughs> stances like. Ah! Hobo Joe 58. I'm glad you enjoy it. Weekly Choco. Like chocolate? LASIK and coffee. You must. Ah! Mm, basic no coffee, means. you must. Mm. Yeah. Metajuro works at NASA. Yay. That's so awesome. Yeah. Automator might help keep the show releases on schedule. True that is true. Many comments removed. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, there were a lot. I removed all of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, physics police. Yeah. I'm excited. In April, I'm going to be interviewing David Eagleman uh, for a Commonwealth Club event at Cal Academy. I think it's at Cal Academy. Mm. You have tickets. I don't even know where I'm supposed to go yet. <laughs> <laughs> Can your assistant come? <sighs> I'll yeah. carry your bags and get you coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'll figure that out. I know it's in April. I believe it's April 10th. Mm -hmm. I believe that is the date. It's in San Francisco. Yes, physics police. Mm -hmm. <gasps> Identity 4, you're awesome. Thank you. I have been relying on you a lot the last few weeks. Just want you to know that. Thank you. Definitely have a place on Science Island. Physics police is going to be there. Now I'm going to be nervous. <laughs> I know. I just feel like there's like this whistle blow from the audience. I know. <laughs> All right, stop. <laughs> whoop, 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 whoop. Uh, stop this interview right here. All right. For me, it's fine. All I have to do is ask questions that get David Eagleman talking. That's I, It's a conversation. I got to get it going. But I'm so excited. It's going to be cool. Because also, I mean, I can say that we do that I do twists, and it's going to be on lots and lots of public radio stations all over the country. Nice. All sorts of people are going to hear it and go, oh, a twist. Hmm, let's go see about this. Yeah. Let's go hear this nice, educated science lady deliver things in a very professional manner. And then they get <laughs> me. And they'll be all like, what the? Ah, this is like a Rickroll or something. This is what I signed up for. Yeah. What the hell happened? Yeah, publicity. Yay. Yeah, it's exciting. Okay, so mm. I've never, Blair, have I awesome ever given you a project? Because I just no. know. You're an intern of the show. I have yet to give you a project to do on the show. I feel like <laughs> I, I should. My pen is out. Okay. So here's here's what here's the idea. And 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 there's there's two phases of this, right? 
But I think this would be the simplest one. A homage to the disclaimer mm. mega episode where you go through the archive, uh, snap out all the disclaimers, and turn it into one long disclaimer o thon that c people could listen to while sleeping. Or, I like this idea, my additional idea at the to this is in the process we get the text of all the disclaimers and we put it together as a book that can be sold in the Amazon self-publishing yes. book marketplace. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Um, I could also... There are only... <laughs> it's, gonna, it's a book though. It's a book Isolate. though. It's going to be like 400... Some, it's as many episodes almost as there are shows. It's like a 400 page book. It's so, ridiculous. so maybe we'll just pick some. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what do you mean? Okay, what if, so it would be oh, a 380 no, it should page be book. Like a, if it was like a coffee table book and it had pictures in it also, I think that'd be really cool. Gord just said he'd help yeah, us yeah, format it. it. Yeah. He's done this. He knows. Yes, is good. That sounds great. Two ninety nine says physics police. Yeah. What an awesome idea, Dr. Key. I thought this was my idea. Ah, oh, it wasn't. Um, but I could also take the disclaimers and I could isolate them into smaller segments and put those on the internet. And I think that that I think smaller could be good. I think also uh, doing um, going back through the YouTube videos mm -hmm. and just cutting out the disclaimer portion of the videos. Mm -hmm. And putting those out because they're really short yeah. and they could be a fun kind of advertisement for twists and they could be shared really easily. Mm -hmm. But that's why I like the archive because the the best disclaimers I've ever done were before video. I mean, there's some really good ones. It was way back when there. I think maybe there've been good ones since too. I there forget. There've been a lot of good disclaimers. I mean, there. Okay. The problem is, I think. I mean, I would love to get a hold of all your computers to see if these the, the disclaimers that you never entered in show notes or, you know, crumpled up and threw away, if they're actually on your computer somewhere? Uh, most of them are not. And most of them weren't on computers in the first place, actually. Most of them would be written uh, on know. scratch paper, bar napkins... <laughs> I did transcribe some of them at the beginning, yeah. but it took a long time. <laughs> yeah, no, the transcriptions are tough. That's what I'm saying. Like, the book idea would I be bet really we could, rough. I bet we could do the crowdsourcing. What is the... There's a website that we does... We used to have uh, transcriptions of a lot of the shows. What's the... Like, What's the transcription Filipino. website? There is a crowd... There's, a like, a crowdsourcing transcription website. Do you guys... Remember or third happened? world labor. There was Google Voice a while back, but that didn't work very well. Yeah, no. And also, like, also, even if you do transcribe, I usually say them wrong anyway. Which is fun. I screwed up every. I screw up every single disclaimer. I think we need to spell my, it. My whole math in, joke was supposed I, to be in my disclaimer, and I like skipped the line while reading it. <laughs> it totally, that's why I thought I just I throw it in left right way through the show. I was like, oh, you know what? That, I never read that line of the. So, um, yeah, but get on it and get it done, in turn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Will I get that raise that you promised me? I will double your salary. Like okay. I said, I would. Great. <laughs> That's You're awesome. going places, kid. Just keep working harder. <laughs> so, There's so like a whole line of other interns behind you waiting to get in here. So if you don't want to perform, you know, it's nothing to me. I don't mean that. I don't care. <laughs> no, um, no speaking live. of the disclaimers, though, I think that there's a couple um, of uh, uh, merchandise options that would be fun, like to have it, like stuff that says disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer on it. With oh, the that's twist. fun. Yeah, with like the I'm twist not... logo down in the corner or something. Never even considered that. That's an awesome idea Thanks. because it's such a huge part of the show. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. It's stick is what it is. Yeah. It's I'm become people, a stick. I want I that t-shirt. 
I want that t-shirt, right? I would actually, yeah, I would love a bumper sticker that said disclaimer, 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 which I could probably have figured out how to get for myself at this modern age of print on demand, anythingness, but, um, yeah. But that with the twist logo in the corner would be fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, just remembering if I can, uh, find the links to them for a while, and I don't, it was the, um, for a while, our show was being transcribed. Mm. So, right, and you'll see it in the show notes of, if you go to our website and look at shows, I think before, it was before the, this week in um, Geek Squad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there it's were, good. every once in a while, it was like notes, it's like, hey, we transcribed your thing. It's like, it would be the first comment in, like, after a bunch of the shows. Yeah, we had these, like, I don't know where they came from, these, the spec uh, you, company of third world board people with computers was transcribing the show into, like, a text. Yeah. And the, the, uh, the women who were... And became fans were, of the show. I'm being like, listeners fan. to the show. Because they're like, yeah, we listen to your show. It's our job. It's rad. Like, it's, it's an awesome job. I think I'm still connected to the guy who uh, like owns the company on Facebook and to one of the women on Facebook. <laughs> if you're there, hello. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. I totally wear a disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer shirt. I can make that for the Zazzle store. Hat. Great. And, <laughs> and underwear. Someone else, who was it? Also suggested. Underwear. Oh, physics police said we could do it's one that said it's head. all in your head. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's also a good one. Underwear. Ah! <laughs> that took me a second. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Yep. I still have my twist pin Wait on my a backpack. Second. I wore it all through Europe. What? Yeah. Is, is that backwards? It's forwards for me. Is it really? Cause mm -hmm. um, reverse it. Why does it look backwards? Switch it for up, me? twist it, and reverse it. <laughs> I'm confused. Yeah, Gord, it's all in your head for a hat. I like it. Ah. Do I, I not can't... read left to right? That looks right, but this is reverse oh, when I'm looking at. Hard. What's going on? Mm -hmm. What's backwards? Everything's reverse. Oh, this is. I'm getting a mirror image. Yeah, you get a mirror image. In my feed. I didn't realize. Oh, yeah. You get a mirror Turn image of around. yourself, but you get it going, going the right way for the other two people. Mm hmm. For the viewing audience. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> Stop hitting me. So How come I didn't notice that after several months of doing this? Oh, look. I can see where my autofocus light is pointing to. Mm hmm. Mm. My wrist is starting to rub too much on the mouse pad. Carpal tunnel. No, I don't like that. So I found a bunch of gold today. <laughs> I would, <laughs> Blair, I like your sign. Like, no smoking, but with a panda. <laughs> yes. No pandas. <laughs> no pandas. This okay. is a panda free zone. Okay, no pandas. <laughs> If anybody out there is a graphic designer who wants to uh, put together a No Pandas shirt, we will put it on our Zazzle, in our Zazzle store. <laughs> Any of these ideas. Otherwise, that's it'll like be... a Davis term, by the way. We <clears throat> like that's evolved. Like certain people are pandas. It usually <laughs> means they're like shy or kind of like slightly passive aggressive, but very weakly so. I thought you were going to say Chinese pandas. and have trouble conceiving. <laughs> and eat a lot of bamboo. <laughs> like toothpicks. <laughs> <laughs> Ulysses quit. Bye-bye. An animal corner sticker. Yeah. All right, everybody. I'm really tired, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are... I think this was fun. You guys had a good, good brainstorm session last week and this was fun this week good next week I will not be here so Blair I will talk to you yeah 
this Just weekend? Are you around? Yes. Just let, me know, let me know what day would be best, and we'll figure it out. Obviously, um, what you're yeah. witnessing here is a complete and total lack of confidence in Justin's ability to push <laughs> buttons or enter passwords into the computer and show up to the show on time to make sure that there is an episode <laughs> next week. And I want to assure all listeners that this is being done for your benefit. <laughs> it's true. It could possibly go bad if it was all left up to me. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. <laughs> There is experience here. <laughs> uh, science chat tomorrow. Yes, I do not have a babysitter, so we'll see how Kai does with iPad babysitter and hot dogs. Jenna Screw, yes, the radio plays do continue to exist <clears throat> and await a date and time in which... Oh, and uh, if... That, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I need to get a link to that, so your radio plays, so that I can uh, put that in my voice demo reel. Next oh. Time. I haven't yeah. done that. I need to get a totally. clip of my character. Yeah. Uh, Betty Bot. And you can uh, re uh, and cre uh, do the bit again. Um, Jan Esku, yes, there are, uh, or Yanni Esku, there are many, many, many of these uh, plays written. I think there's like a half dozen or so fully written. Uh, Kill the Sitter still hasn't listened to the radio play. Oh, God. I don't even know if I have a link to it. Anybody have a link to it? It's in the... Uh, let's see. Hang on a second. Give me a second. I bet I can Sure. It. I bet. It's like... It's your uh, show, Justin. Uh-huh. 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 uh Whoa, that's not what I was looking for. Yeah. Not interested. YouTube. Psh. Oops. Don't you hate it when everything tries to make you say twist instead of twist? Yeah, and I especially get upset because now there's a show called Twist. <sighs> Karen Bondar and Phil Plate. Weekly Science News. No! Yeah, I get, I'm really kind of upset about it. This week is stupid. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm thinking. Science and technology. It's not just science, you know. What? But anyway, we're not them. We do something different. I don't have any claim, you know... I can't stop them from doing it, but it's upsetting because they're kind of colleagues, and really, really, did you have to do that? Really? Not really colleagues, and it's just kind of church. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Dude, how come I can't find it? I don't know. It's out there on the internet somewhere. What are you looking for? I went away for a second. Um, I'm trying to find the radio play for somebody. Oh, I know what I'm doing. Oh, Ooh, Mark, Mark 8675 came up with your links. Did that? SoundCloud, Jackson Fly, Jack Feedback. Oh, come on, I can't find it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Chrono Cruises. Chrono that's the Cruises. One. Yeah. Cultivator found it, yes. Yes, tr uh, Twist is trademarked, copyrighted. Uh, it's been branded on uh, several past interns. Oh, which reminds me, Blair, uh, you don't have the tattoo yet. Uh, what's up with that? <laughs> oh, wait, she's on the phone. Is she having an off the air conversation? Mark 8675, uh, awesome. Nice to She's making plans. I'm so totally going to listen to the show tonight. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to listen. Sorry, to yes? <sighs> cool, cool, cool. cool. Justin, you rang? It while I'm packing. No, oh, yeah, I was just mentioning it. We just, it just got pointed out that you're the only intern that doesn't have the official twist tattoo yet. 
<laughs> How did that happen for this long? That's going to so continue we're gonna on the <laughs> We're going to have to get that uh, figured out. All right. This corporeal form is clean, and it's staying that way. So. Mine's okay. not. Corporeal. <laughs> clean. That is such a relative term. I know, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for you, those of you who are smart enough not to get tattoos, I love tattoos, <laughs> and I have friends that have them, and I and I love them on other people. It's just I personally have never like thought it would be good at a specific location on me. It's just not my bag, you know. Yeah, it wasn't mine either. Like my dad actually had the greatest advice. My pops was like, okay. You can get any tattoo you want, but here's what you got to do. You got to have it drawn up, like, you know, it's like, yeah, 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 they're going to totally draw it up with all the details. It's going to be in there, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, okay. And and you get that, that, that tattoo, and you put it on the wall right next to your bed. <clears throat> yeah. And if after a year of waking up every day and seeing it and still thinking it's the most awesome thing in the world, go ahead and get it. It probably is. Yeah, my rule used to be if I still wanted the same tattoo in the same location after three years, <laughs> then oh, I could three years get it. is probably a little better. But then I one day I that. had a dream that I had a tattoo, mm -hmm. a bunch of tattoos. And in the dream I had them, I was totally happy. I was like, oh, yeah, those are my tattoos. That's awesome. That's cool. And then when I woke up, they weren't there. I was like, ah. Oh. So then I went and got them. Like that week. Wow. Yeah. What are they? Oh god. <laughs> what did I ask for? <laughs> what? Wow. What's going on? I missed it. I think I've seen it before though. Probably. Spine stars. I had spine stars that's in my right. dream. Spine I was stars. like, spine stars, right on, that's my tattoos. That and probably I woke hurt up and they a real. lot, right? Um, actually, no, not at all, really. Um, except for the the lower one. Like, uh -huh. there's five and all, they start bigger and they go smaller. And then, like, the lower oh, back shit. one was like, <sighs> But my consolation was, like, there was this guy getting his, like, 40th Hell's Angel tattoo, like, uh -huh. colored in. And it's like, oh, is it your first tattoo? I'm like, yeah, it's my first. And then the tattoo artist guy was like, actually, it's his first five. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm a badass. <laughs> I, forgot. Uh -huh. I forgot. I'm totally rocking this. That's funny. Yeah, I don't know. I just get sick of my own, like, appearance so often, and I have to change it up that, yeah, tattoos are a bit permanent, but then yeah. you get them removed. You start over. Yeah, I'm not really <laughs> into that process. <laughs> My a friend of mine uh, told me about a new process, which sounds so interesting. It's like um, some kind of nano material, nano molecular tattoo removal where um, instead of doing laser removal, what they do is they just um, like wipe, smear a gel on top of it, mm. on top of your tattoo, and then they cover it up and the gel goes into your skin and it gets, it attaches to the ink molecules and the, uh, I guess the... Um, I'm not thinking of the word, but anyway, the color molecules, and then draws them, it breaks it up and draws them back up to the surface, so the ink mm. comes out, and so you just need to do, it's, yeah, it's like some kind of chemical thingy, I have no idea, <laughs> I don't know, he was very excited about it, I thought it sounded really interesting, I had never, thank Neural you physics, please, pigments, yeah, a new removal process, which is supposedly... Uh, faster and cheaper and more comfortable than laser removal. But then you don't sparkle in an MRI machine anymore. Sparkle! Is that a thing? 
Apparently, yeah, because a lot of uh, pigments for the tattoos are metal based. Some of them are, I guess, based on that. Yeah. And can when you get a tattoo, you're injecting spark. metal based pigments into your skin? Yes, you uh, are. Yeah. Yeah. And the pigments go into your cells, and they they go into little vesicles in your cells, and then they're happy there. And they live oh, there. Forever. They live there. That sounds scary. Yeah. It's not scary. <laughs> Wait, do you have earrings? Yes. Are your ears pierced? Yeah, they are. Do you have metal, like, <laughs> in your skin? Like, right now? Oh, how can you do that? That's, like, uh, yeah. totally something. Mm -hmm. that was no, I was just surprised. I had no idea the, the ink was metal-based. And actually, uh, uh, supposedly, uh, it can, you know, with the right metals and the proper concentration, heat up. In, a, in an MRI. Wow. Yeah. Possibly. Pass, it, it, a very specific. It would have <laughs> to be a very specific I would like though. to know that. That would be hmm. a good question. Hmm. Uh, Science Island uh, tattoo artist. Science Island will have everything that the outside world does except with good people. That's only good people. It's good people. That's the only people we're going to have there. That's what I'm saying. How can you make that judgment without having an extensive pre-interview process? Do they watch the show? Then they're in. I mean, whatever their defaults are, it can't be that bad. They like the show. You do realize we've had right. trolls in the chat room before, right? <laughs> yeah, but you know, even the you trolls, trolls, I mean, on once Sci -Sci? The trolls, trolls are just people who are looking for acceptance from somebody. Mm -hmm. That's all they are. Yep. But if they don't believe in basic sciencey things, physics police says they, they, the tattooed pig, they figured out it wouldn't explode in an MRI. No, nobody's going to explode in an MRI. That wasn't the. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think people were complaining of exploding humans in MRI machines because of tattoos, but. Yeah, maybe a little light sparking. I want ray guns. Can I have old like, ray guns? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can run around Silence Island. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. But Just everyone in... who lives on Science Island will have to believe in uh, in climate change. That's my <laughs> that's my personal requirement. Oh, interesting. In Old Norse sources, beings described as trolls dwell in isolated rocks, mountains, or caves, live together in small family units, and are rarely helpful to human beings. Oh, that sounds like bacteria. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's like in, uh, in Epcot Center when you go to the countries and one of them is Norway and you take you can go on a ride where there's trolls that jump out at you that's a troll well my uh, my heritage is Norwegian at least mm. partially Scandinavian Norwegian nice. trolls trolls I have trolls in my kitchen for good luck mm. oh, yeah there's many different kinds of trolls right yeah yeah treasure trolls I like that gourd why? Where did Justin go? Cause I'm I don't tired. know. I'm I know. I want to hang up. Can I hang it's up? Time to wrap he... up. Yep. Okay, he's coming back. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm tired. It's ten thirty. It's past my bedtime. Gotta go to sleep. Uh, tired. I have so much to do. Yeah, I'm at a juro, but I wasn't talking about the cells in us. I was talking about the cells that live in the rocks and the caves and ignore us completely do their own thing. They don't care about us. Pink haired trolls. Darker haired. I don't have any pink haired trolls. I, don't. I was a child in the time of the height of the troll craze. That was pretty weird. I never understood it. You don't have to understand it. You just have to live with it. Yeah, but I didn't want a doll with crazy hair that was naked with a jewel in its belly. I didn't want it. <laughs> but didn't you like going and like that, and its hair would go? So you could take the hair and make it go out like that, and you go with the doll, and the hair would go. 
I never got over its face, though. And the fact that it was naked and there was a jewel in its belly. <laughs> Seemed weird. I didn't yeah. understand. I got pink hair! Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. I have a giant belly button ring. No. <laughs> yeah. Trolls with belly button rings. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Trolls like jewels and stuff. Mm-hmm. They like that glittery stuff. Justin, I want to go. I want to go to bed. I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> Cord's troll wears a Santa outfit. Nice. Glowing eyes, huh, Janiscu? Mm. <laughs> Good night, Goldazator. Good night, everyone who's hanging out still and chit-chatting with us. Um, science chat tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Twist will be on next Thursday night, and I'll be in San Diego if anyone is going to be attending the San Diego Science Festival. I'll be there. Sounds super fun. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. And then, um, what else? What else? And then we'll do another show. Oh, I might do science chat next Friday. Yeah, I could probably do science chat next Friday. That's probably doable. And then we do a twist the following week. And then the week after, the first weekend week of April, I will have no computer um, because I will have just moved. The day mm. mm-hmm. Well, I might have a computer. We'll see. I will do what I can to broadcast from my basement. Is yeah, um, my where, Viking heritage? You don't have to tell me the actual address on the air, but is your <laughs> is your new uh, house uh, uh, close? Bernal, the Bernal Heights. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, nice. yeah. Probably have a very good mm-hmm. view. Are you? Hmm. I, I don't. It's not a. It's not a great view. I mean, it's it's okay. Mm-hmm. It's not a great view. Um. Probably two eighty might two eighty might be your best way to get over there. Probably, yeah. Once I move, Mm -hmm. rather than going over the hill and through the woods. (laughs) Yeah. Justin, thanks a lot. I will have a pooter. I still have my computer. Uh, I'm going to go to bed, so I'm going to hang up and end the broadcast. Okay. And that's going to make an end of things. Good night, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the Post Post Show. Post 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 Post. My grandmother used to make me drink Postum. Huh? Back in Mudville? <laughs> Look it up. <laughs> That's right. Night-night, everybody. Sleep well.